one. I'd like to call to order this session of the Tacoma Park City Council. Can the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Stewart. Here. Council Member Tarr. <coughs> Council Member Dabala. Here. Council Member Costick. Here. Council Member Siemens. Present. Council Member Smith. Here. Council Member Searcy. Did you say me? I'm Mayor Stewart. Yes. <laughs> I thought I started oh, with did you. I, okay. <laughs> You're always first. Oh, yeah, I, oh, it's going to be one of those nights. Um, all right, our agenda this evening has no changes. Uh, we have one other meeting before our August break, which is next week is our final meeting. Um, we have, we'll be here at 7.30 in the auditorium. Our voting session is the second reading ordinance uh, approving the FY 2020 Budget Amendment 1. Uh, second reading ordinance approving the FY 2020 Storm Wa Management Budget Amendment 1. Second reading ordinance adopting a pay structure for staff that are members of ASME. Resolution providing for appointments to committees. Resolution providing for appointments to the 2019-2020 Youth Council. Resolution setting forth dates of the City Council summer recess. Single reading ordinance awarding a contract for community play. And tentatively, uh, a single reading ordinance awarding a contract for ar architectural designs for the library. Um, and then after next Wednesday, uh, we will not meet again officially until September 11th, Wednesday, September 11th. All right, starting our meeting tonight, we will start with public comments on voting items. Our first voting item is the first reading ordinance approving FY 2020 budget amendment number one. Any public comments on that? Second item is the first reading ordinance approving FY 2020 storm management fund budget amendment number one. Any public comments on that? Next is our first reading ordinance adopting a pay structure for staff that are members of ASME. Next, we have a resolution authorizing submission of the MML legislative action requests. Any public comments on that? And then finally, a resolution adopting the hazard mitigation plan. Any public comments on that? All right, seeing none, we will now move into our voting session. The first item is the first reading ordinance approving FY 2020 budget amendment number one. I know there were a couple of clarifications since our work session, so I'm going to turn it over first before the deputy senior manager before I asked for someone to move the ordinance. Got there quickly. I hadn't even pulled out the paper. Um, yes, the uh, only change from uh, last week's work session to tonight's first reading is the addition of uh, the police space renovation funds in the amount of $326,900. Um, this is associated with the uh, police renovation project where we will be uh, closing in the atrium and providing more space in the um, entrance area um, for dispatchers. And this, what, these funds were included in the fiscal year 19 budget. Uh, we hope that work will be starting um, in the next few months and we just need to carry over the funds for that project. Um, that's the only change um, from last week and I don't expect we'll have any, before, any additional ones before the second reading. That was simply due to an oversight when we were um, going through the budget. Uh, for fiscal year 19 and figuring out what we needed to carry forward. All right. Will someone like to move the ordinance? Yes. Councilman DeBala moved. Do I have a second? Councilman, uh, Council Member Siemens. Any other questions or discussion of the first reading ordinance approving the FY 2020 budget amendment number one? Very quick Council question. Councilman um, On the police space renovation, that is 326000 out of, is that essentially all of the project? And, and the reason for the delay, I assume, is because of. I, I don't um, know. I don't remember people. off the top of my head what the total uh, project budget is. We have spent funds on the design, and now we're going to be doing okay. the construction. Thank you. I All right. All those in favor of the first reading ordinance approving FY 2020 budget amendment number one, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Next, we have the first reading ordinance approving FY 2020 storm management budget. So our management fund budget amendment number one. Would someone like to move the ordinance? <coughs> oh, do we have to vote to go into stormwater? The stormwater board? No. Good question, but no, we don't. Would someone like to move the ordinance? Move. Councilwoman Searcy moved. Do I have a second? Second. Councilwoman uh, Caustic second. Any questions or comments on this? Seeing none, all those in favor of the first reading ordinance approving the FY 2020 Stormwater Management Fund Budget Amendment Number 1, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Next is the first reading ordinance adopting a pay structure for staff that are members of ASME. Would someone like to move this ordinance? Move it. 
Councilman, Council Member Siemens, do I have a second? Council Member Smith, <coughs> any questions or discussion? Councilman Damala? Are th this is essentially identical to the pay structure. This, I get, let me rephrase that as a question. Is this essentially identical to the great, the pay, wage and wage structure that we passed for yes, non-union Yes, this is the same. Okay. And do you have any comment on the status of um, adopting this for police officers below the rank of sergeant or for UFC W local 400 because this is only this is for ask me our other uh, bargaining unit is um, local 400 for the officers and that they, they have votes scheduled I think early August okay. so it'll be September when we adopt that okay. uh, our intention if that is is approved by them is that those um, increases for local 400 members or represented staff um, would still take effect as of July 1, so it would be retroactive after that goes through. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of the ordinance adopting a pay structure for the staff that are members that ask me, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right. <coughs> Our next is a resolution authorizing submission of MML legislative action request. I do believe there's been a change to this. Um, I think Councilwoman uh, Dabala and Councilmember Smith put forward changes that are in your blue folder. Councilman Dabala, do you want to discuss the changes you've put forward? Um, yes, they were they were uh, concerning the community choice aggregation section, and they were in response. They are in response to two things: one, additional legal research that the city attorney did about what <coughs> precisely what municipal authorities are out there now and how much more authority we would need to do the kinds of programs we've been talking about. So um, I think the yeah, that's why the word expanded in front of authority because it is technically there is very, very limited authority at the moment. Um, and that's and, and then my second thank you. My second uh, potential change had to do with s uh, similar to certain counties because the, the, the point of this, as Council Member Smith pointed out in, a, in an email, is, is that we don't have the authority that Montgomery County does to do the kind of program that they do to reach lower income seniors, for example, um, who might benefit from a tax deferral program. So we're not pulling this out of thin air. It exists for counties, and we would just like to have the, si the similar authority. So those are the two changes, three changes. The third one is in the whereas is, which just says the same thing. Are you okay with that? Council Member Smith, do you have anything else to add, or do we cover it? All right. So the three, just so we're all clear, um, each year for the Maryland Municipal League, um, we put forward as a city council three legislative action requests. These are then reviewed by MML's legislative committee and then they decide for, the, uh, for MML what are the legislative items that <coughs> MML will uh, pursue in the upcoming um, assembly session in Annapolis. So this year, we're, the three we are voting on tonight to move forward to MML include legislation to grant municipal authority to implement property tax deferrals to certain categories of homeowners that Councilman Dabala was just speaking to. The second is legislative legislation to authorize a group of counties and or municipalities to form or join a community choice aggregator to purchase or generate electricity from renewable sources for their residents. The City Council has championed this legislation in the past and it's legislation that Delegate Sharkudian, our D20 delegate, um, put forward in the last uh, session. And the third item is legislation or sources of funding to assist rental property owners to eliminate environmental hazards in, rep in rental properties including lead. All right, those are the three items. Would someone like to move the resolution? I would like to move the resolution. Councilman DeBaller, Councilmember Seaman second. Any other discussion or comments? 
Seeing none, all those in favor of the resolution authorizing transmittal of the legislative action request to the to MML for consideration, please say aye. Aye. Any opposing? Any abstaining? Great. All right, our final item tonight is resolution adopting the hazard, hazard mitigation plan. Uh, there was also a change put forward by Councilwoman Caustic that is in your folders as well. <coughs> Councilwoman Caustic, do you want to just tell us your change? Sure. Um, as part of the hazard mit mitigation plan, there was, uh, as we discussed, a section describing Tacoma Park and our master plan that included some information regarding Silver Spring and did not seem to adequately and appropriately uh, describe Tacoma Park. So similar to the language that was used when this plan was adopted in 2013, I added some language to ask that at the earliest convenience or when the plan is next updated, we um, ask that they update the, the profile, the community profile. So I'd actually like to add, to clarify here, add a word to the language that has been added here. Um, it would now say, uh, be it resolved that the Council of the City of Tacoma Park, um, that the Montgomery County Hazard Mitigation Plan of 2018 is adopted subject to making Tacoma, the Tacoma Park community profile description updates at the earliest opportunity or when the plan is next up updated. I think it makes sense to add making before that. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Great. Um, would someone like to move the resolution? Nope. Councilman Caustic, do I have a second? Second. Councilmember Siemens, you're just like the second tonight. That's right. Um, <laughs> any other discussion or comment on the resolution? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right, that is the last of our voting items tonight, and we're a bit early on public comments, but I know uh, we do have someone who wanted to uh, go <clears throat> come to speak uh, to us and get an extra time tonight that was requested beforehand. So if you want to start, that would be great. Oh, I need to turn you on. Hold on one sec. I'm Ms. Kleemeyer from uh, Ward 1. Councilman Peter Kova read this book cover to cover in early July. <laughs> it's called Bringing Nature Home, and it's by Professor Douglas Tallamy, who's Professor Emeritus of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Denver, I mean, sorry, of Delaware. Um, this book does for ecosystems and ecology and biodiversity what an inconvenient truth did for climate change. It makes the science and the threat accessible <coughs> to all of us. It provides a basis for understanding the very dire consequences of not taking action. It outlines practical steps that, Tacoma, that, that communities can take, including um, Tacoma Park. And it would provide an excellent basis for a discussion come September about what Tacoma Park might like to do in order to um, restore and support the underpinnings of our ecology and protect biodiversity in our own community. Councilman Kovar didn't only read the book, he went to Mayor Stewart and said, I think you should read this book too, and I will lend you my copy. And um, much to her credit, uh, Mayor Stewart said, okay, and despite having a very um, formidable reading list already for August. So with that exemplary um, role model set by Councilman Kovar, uh, my neighbors and friends, and actually some people I don't know very well at all, decided we would copycat him. And we gathered together our personal copies of Bringing Nature Home, and I am here to lend them for the month of August to the rest of you um, for your reading. Now, and I hope that you will follow the very good example set by the mayor and say, okay. Um, if this seems formidable, and I know you have other plans for August, I do have two hints for you. Um, one, uh, Councilman Kovar set a very high bar by reading it cover to cover. Really, if you read the first 70 pages, it's, it's got the main messages. And it's, it's easy reading and it has lots of pictures. Uh, two, you can Google uh, the YouTube video called 
Bringing Nature Home to Tacoma Park that was filmed by our own City TV here in this very auditorium with Professor Talamy on that very stage. And in that way, in really less than an hour and a half, you could get the main messages and your fellow members might not know that you hadn't gotten all the way through um, the book. So thank you very much. I, I don't normally comment during the middle of public comment period, but I just want to tell my uh, fellow members of the council that I wasn't aware that they would be getting a reading assignment based on what I was doing. And I feel a little bit like I could have gotten away with reading a shorter uh, part of the book and gotten equal credit for it. So now I'm wondering if I uh, should have done that. But thank you, uh, Liz, for circulating the material. Great. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, any other public comments this evening? Yeah. Or whomever. <laughs> We'll stay on the trees. <laughs> okay. uh, good evening. My name is Brian Richmond. I'm from Ward 2. And I'm a former instructor at the University of Maryland and a recently retired federal project officer with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Through the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, I'm also a trained Maryland woodland steward, as well as a member of the Maryland State Beekeepers Association. As the Tacoma Park Council, I would like to request that you actively support an effort to promoting the planting of native species here in Tacoma Park. As you're most likely aware, there's a projected extinction of various flora and fauna species worldwide, and this is related to climate change, the increased use of pesticides, herbicides, a reduction in national, natural habitat, and reduced availability of animals' food sources. In an effort to think globally and act locally, we in Tacoma Park can be at the vanguard of helping to turn around this dire forecast. Our health, and indeed our very existence, depends upon supporting ecological diversity. In short, we as members of the top of the food chain depend on those in the lower strata for our survival, and it all begins with native plants and the insects that interact with them in the ecological web. If you've not already done so, I encourage you to read Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants. I'm very supportive of uh, Douglas Tamami's approach to help remedy one of our current environmental challenges. In short, he's suggesting that by reducing the number of non-native plants in our local environments, for example, backyards and parks, and encouraging the growth of native plants, native species, we will help to better support this delicate balance of nature. We need to educate and encourage Tacoma Park residents to plant native species that will support the ecological web. For example, see page 147 in Talamy's book. Uh, for a table entitled Woody Plants Ranked by Their Ability to Support Lepidoptera Species. Those are butterflies. And if you'd like, I would welcome the opportunity to further discuss this issue with you in person. Uh, thank you in advance for your consideration of this request, and I hope you enjoy reading and bringing nature home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. My name is Mark Fisher. I'm a resident of Ward 5, and I'm a member of the Friends of uh, uh, Maryland Tacoma Park Library. I want to speak in, in favor of the current renovation plan of the library. I believe that right now it's the best choice we can make of what we could do in the future for this library system. Three major points. A lot of people are concerned about the flood plan and the 100-year flood concerns. Those concerns are best dealt with with the plan that the architect is proposing. They, uh, the current library would essentially be a dam with the water running right into the library, and the, the plan for the, the, that the architect has proposed is effect, an effective way of dealing with those flood-building problems. Second thing. Some people have mentioned the possibility that we could move to higher ground at the Washington Adventist campus. That would be true, but for the time that we are in now, if that plan had been proposed five years ago with the planning that would be needed, it's a possible thing. Proposing it now and moving for it now would be essentially the same as killing our library. So it's something that, it's something that was possible, but it's not possible in the world that we live in today. And finally, the library is a tremendously valuable resource for the community. It is particularly valuable for the children in the community. I went to the library's 84th birthday party, and it was just 
thrilled to see the children that were there and the way that they dug in and enjoyed supporting their library. And those people, especially in Ward 5, where we don't get a lot of support from the people that live in the ward, their children do. And this is something that we do, that we can support those children in those wards, even if their parents aren't actively supporting the, in the voting in the civic life of the community. So um, please consider and vote for the current plans for a re renovation of the library. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Kathy Serace, and my husband and I have lived in Tacoma Park for 38 years, the last 28 on Tulip Avenue. We've raised our two children here, they're now adults, and they still live in the area. The Tacoma Park, Maryland Library has been part of our family's life for four decades. Recently, I retired and I joined the board of the Friends of the Tacoma Park Library where I'm working on outreach to seniors and people with disabilities to encourage their usage of the library and to maybe work on developing some programs to attract them to the library. I've reviewed a lot of the information about the plan to renovate the library, the options, the financing, and I've concluded that it is a vital step for you to take to vote to support moving forward on this project. The library now has some very serious problems with its HVAC system and it needs to come into compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. The funding for the project to renovate the library has been obtained and cannot be returned. If we were just to move forward and try to address the immediate problems and not do the entire project, my understanding is it would cost nearly as much or the same. And we would end up with the library that has even less space for books than it now does because of the ADA issues and what that would entail and it would not address the flooding concerns. Moving the library for reasons that have been mentioned as well as, as my understanding would be a higher cost. I think there are so many great things about the library but I just wanna mention a few. I think it's really in the ideal location. Not only have my children and all of their friends benefited over the years from being able to walk to the library, but it's near three schools, Piney Branch, Tacoma Middle, and Tacoma Elementary. I know many of my children's friends have walked there after school to work on projects, and sometimes because their parents want, were not gonna be home and wanted them to be able to have a good activity while they were alone after school. When I go into the library, I don't just see children, I see adults, college age and older, working and using the computers. I know my time is over, so I'll just say again, I think this is a critical resource, resource for our community, and I urge you to vote in favor of moving forward on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Farrell Hamer. I live on Holly Avenue. Um, and I've, we've only lived there for 34 years, so um, I'm a newcomer still. Um, I'm gonna speak to you about the library tonight and in my, both in my capacity as a professional and also as a citizen of Tacoma Park. As some of you know, I um, am a landscape architect and an urban designer. I have worked for 30 years in various local governments around DC. I started in Prince George's County. I was the acting director of the Montgomery County Planning Department for a brief stint, and I finished my career as the planning director of the city of Alexandria. And it's in that capacity that I'd like to tell you um, that I looked at the new relatively, the most recent 
um, building on the website for the library, and I'm, I'm so happy. In fact, I'm, I'm thrilled. I think the building is beautiful. And I think that the, um, I, I know that there are people who are disappointed that the old building can't really function any longer. Um, it was homey and unpretentious, but it's also dark and crowded. And the new building will have much higher ceilings. It will have a huge amount of natural light. It will have more space. And I think it will, um, and I think that the new design also re responds to a lot of community concerns that have been, that I've heard from the beginning of this project. For one thing, all the major trees are saved. That was a huge community issue. Not every tree, but the major trees and the biggest uh, willow oak, that's the closest to this sidewalk, is absolutely saved. Secondly, the green space in the lot front of the library will remain much the same as it is now. Not exactly the same, it's a little bit smaller, but it's largely the same. It's the same kind of setback and the same kind of feeling. Um, and also, the, the library will be larger and it will feel more open thanks to the addition of the curved glass wall, which connects the two L's. The, the library is sort of a squatty L-shaped. And by adding the curved wall that connects the two ends of the L's, you capture a huge amount of additional space without actually changing the footprint all that much. I thought that was a stroke of genius, and I think it will um, really benefit the overall usage of the library. Um, the other thing that I really like is that from the outside, when you look at that curved glass wall, it really announces itself as a library. And I liked it because even though the, mm, even though the, uh, there's a lot of glass, it's broken up by louvers that to me look a little bit like library shelves. And I think it's really attractive to have a human scale and to have a building that sort of announces what it is a, a little bit. Um, uh, the other thing I especially want to talk about is the siting because that was raised too. As a planner, environmental justice is very important to me. Walkability is also important. I did what planners do. I did a little bit of a radius study, which I will be happy to share to, with you. The entire library is within a mile of almost the whole city and with a half a mile of most of three wards. So I think you might be surprised when you see how well the library serves the, uh, the community, the whole community of Tacoma Park, and also the, li the location where it is now. OK, just Hi. one <laughs> sentence. That's it. One sentence. It's an obvious great place because it serves three schools. And the, com the complex there with the three schools on it is a wonderful thing for children to have the library so close in it. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments this evening? Hi, I'm Elizabeth Wallace on Holly Avenue. Um, I just wanted to say a public thank you to Patty, Ma Ma is it Malin or Malin? Sorry, <laughs> um, of Housing and uh, Community Development, who put on a seminar for short-term rentals, uh, along with Montgomery County uh, Health and Human Services. I was able to present at the that meeting as well. Um, the anybody who's uh, short-term rentals are like quote unquote Airbnbs or other companies like that. Um, and it's, there's a kind of an overlap between whether you should have an owner-occupied group home license and or an STR license from the county or both, et cetera. So it's really important to talk to Matt and Patty about that, and I just encourage anybody who's thinking of doing it to do so. Um, and thanks for the article in the newsletter. Um, the um, thank you also, um, I serve also on the Police Advisory Committee, and thank you also for looking again at an MOU. Um, I think that's really, really important based on our location. And the last thing is, the only thing I'm concerned about with the library is that a temporary space hasn't been identified for library storage and operations yet. And sometimes the only way I can get away from my house since I work there with Airbnb is with a good book, okay? So help me with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anand Parikh, Ward 1, uh, resident since 2003, but I've put three kids through this library. Um, I just wanted to commend the city council and the city staff on showing the movie last night and supporting our right to watch movies that might be controversial, but in the end might not be. So thank you for showing us, letting us see the movie tomorrow, last night. 
Thank you. Any other public comments this evening? No other public comments? All right, seeing none then, um, we will move on to council comments. Do we have any council comments this evening? Council McCaustic. I'll be brave and go first tonight. <laughs> um, I just have a couple of, of comments. First of all, I wanted to thank the people who came to my Ward 3 play date over the weekend. On Saturday, we, uh, we had to move indoors because it was so hot. So thank you for the, to the city manager for helping us get some space here in the community center. And we had a nice time. It was a great opportunity for people with young kids who were stuck inside because it was so hot to just come on over and hang out and play and uh, just chat. So I, I think it was a great event and I'm hoping to have another one uh, in the fall or winter. And then I just wanted to give a couple updates to my colleagues and others regarding the uh, TPB meeting, the Transportation Planning Board meeting today. Uh, we adopted a proclamation um, declaring car free days, which will be September 21st through the 23rd. That's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And there is an effort to get as many people as possible to pledge to be car free during those days. So if you're interested in doing that, you can go to www.carfreemetrodc.org and you can pledge to be car free during those days. Um, there's also a e-scooter training, as the second one that Montgomery County DOT is hosting uh, this Saturday at the MNC, MNC PPC building on Georgia Avenue in Silver Spring in the morning from 10 a.m. to noon. And this is a chance to try out the e-scooters if you haven't tried them before, as well as the e-bikes that companies are offering. What they've found through some of the research they've done when looking at the scooters is that the highest number of accidents actually happen in the first few times people are using these because they're just not familiar with using them. So this is a chance, I guess I, I, guess I went too long. <laughs> Um, so this is a chance to uh, <laughs> this is a chance to give it a try in a safe safe location. And I, I actually went to the last one, and it was a great opportunity to just kind of ride around the parking lot and go around some cones and talk with um, people from the DOT as well as the uh, scooter companies. So I encourage people to give that a try. And then um, we also got very good news that Tacoma Park received grant funding through a uh, TA set aside program, which is the the new name for the TAP program. And the application was for a Tacoma Park Safe Routes to School Improvements program. And we received uh, $80,494 $80, $80, for that program. So thank you to um, Lucy Nair and the, the people who worked on that application. And finally, we had a thorough discussion about the Harry Nice Bridge, which is located in um, southeast Maryland uh, between Maryland and Virginia. We've had a number of discussions since May regarding the bridge and um, a promise from MDOT to initially include a separated bike lane on that bridge, which they later um, changed their mind on more or less. And um, the board had, has been advocating for that separated bike lane and we took a vote today. Um, I voted against moving forward and um, allowing an amendment that would, allow, that would provide the opportunity for them to move forward regardless of whether there is a separated bike lane. Um, they still are promising, it did pass, so they will be moving forward regardless. Um, but MDOT has promised that they are still looking into opportunities for bike um, accommodations and it's possible there will be a separated bike lane but at the moment, it, it doesn't look terrifically good. So we'll have some more information about that in the fall, probably. And that's all I have. Thank you. Any other council comments this evening? Councilman Dabala. Yeah, just very briefly, uh, this Friday is a joint meeting of the regional uh, council of governments committees for the, the Bay um, and water quality with the Environment and Climate, uh, Energy and Climate Change Committee. These are both regional committees staffed by local elected officials. Um, and the joint meeting is going to be about the role of trees in climate change. And if anyone is interested in seeing the background materials, 
um, email me because they're really quite, quite good. Um, secondly, on the COG theme, um, a couple of us went to a, a housing retreat over the weekend, um, and again, the materials that were provided were really, really instructive. Um, I'm circulating them to a couple of the council members that weren't there, but if any resident is interested in housing, uh, particularly housing uh, affordability, some of the examples from other communities are really fascinating, um, how they've been able to, to thread their way through these issues. Um, and last, um, next week on Thursday, I'll be leaving town for a bit, so if there were two residents, um, you wanna get in touch with me about any of the many issues going on in Ward 2, please uh, please know that um, you've got a week to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to say another word or two about uh, the, the comments on trees, I do appreciate um, uh, Liz's uh, comments in particular. And um, I think already because of her advocacy and some others in the community who have talked about the importance of biodiversity and the connection to uh, native planting. I think we're talking more and more about that in the context of the work we're doing on trees, so I think that's helpful. And on the tree uh, work, there's a long way to go on that. I think uh, as uh, one of my colleagues mentioned, we'll be next talking about it in September and there'll be a number of months to go, but I think that to me, and, and uh, I, I think uh, increasingly uh, among the rest of us, that's something that, uh, a theme that should be woven into the work that we do. So thanks again for, for that. Um, Council Member Duvall mentioned the uh, Council of Governments and um, the, com the committee that I'm, on, that I'm on is the Metropolitan Washington Air Quality Committee, which they call, which we call MWAC. And there have been several strategic planning efforts on, that have taken place this year, and, and the next round of that is tomorrow, and that's from 10 to 2, so I'll be at that. And since I already finished that other book, then I'll be reading these materials for that. But I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll report back on that um, afterwards. I don't, no decisions are being made tomorrow, but it's a, it's a four-hour kind of retreat type uh, event to talk about uh, how to uh, help the committee better serve us, how we can interact better with them so that it's not just a scientific committee operating off in the corner by itself. And then uh, thirdly, I did just want to say I was, it was a, a tough, but I think in the end, uh, to me anyway, worthwhile presentation that we had last night w with the film. And um, I think for a lot of people, it was difficult to hear some of the things that were said. And there were a lot of different views. There weren't just two views. Um, I think given where we were, to me, I said this before, it was better to have the film, screen the film and, and have the discussion than just screen it on its own or not screen it. But I recognize there are people who won't agree with that and, and who, who may never agree with it. Um, half of my family, on one side of my family, were Jewish. And uh, you know, on that side of the family, I was always sort of told you discuss everything. You don't shy away from anything. I recognize other people will look at that completely differently. But I, I think in the end, it was a more positive than negative experience. And I think most people looked at it, um, looked at the different viewpoints that they were hearing, at least giving people the respect to listen to it, even if they weren't convinced. And so I think in that sense, it was a positive. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments this evening? Okay, moving on. Um, uh, I was at the COG board meeting with uh, Councilman Dabala, and it was, a, it was a terrific meeting talking about housing with our colleagues in Virginia and in DC. And it's really exciting that we talked about um, the possibility of actually adopting a regional plan looking at housing affordability. Um, if this actually moves forward, um, COG would be, our region would be the first region in the U.S. to actually adopt a re regional targets on housing affordability. So it's really exciting. It was a great meeting. Um, and I will also say that um, at the meeting was County Councilman Nancy Navarro, who served on the uh, working group that was working on uh, affordable housing uh, for the board. And we had a presentation from Gwen Wright from the planning department here in Montgomery County. So it was a terrific meeting. 
Um, I want to thank everyone who came out for lunch today and the folks at the Crossroads Farmer's Market. It was a beautiful day to have lunch at the Farmer's Market. Uh, it was a busy day. Uh, it was very busy. It was packed at the Farmer's Market and Pat Rumba was there uh, with Play Day America and it was a, just a great um, day. So don't forget, Wednesdays 11 to 3 o'clock, um, the Farmer's Market at the Crossroads. On Friday, we have uh, lunch with the mayor at uh, Tiffin Restaurant. Um, so that will be from 12 to about 2 o'clock if people would like to attend that. Um, and I just also want to, um, since Council Member Kovar mentioned, um, thank everyone who did come out last night and all of the emails that we have received regarding the showing of the film. As we've mentioned, this was not an easy decision. Um, and um, I'm glad we moved forward with it. Um, and I just really want to thank the city staff who worked really hard um, to put this together. Um, I know we'll, we'll, we will be looking at and reviewing how the Arts and Humanities Committee, working with the staff, um, set criteria for future programs. Um, but I just want to say thank you particularly um, to Donna Wright, our communication specialist, um, who took many phone calls from press and other folks, and Theo Brown, who is the moderator that we hired to help us put together the panel and moderate the discussion last night. And um, so thank you to everyone. Um, and I think with that, I'll turn it over to the city manager. Thank you very much. Um, last week in my comments, I mentioned that the Silver Spring Intermediate Neighborhood Park Plan, which is on uh, Philadelphia Avenue, um, would be going before the planning board. and it didn't. Um, there was some administrative mix-up and it was not ready for showing to the planning board and so it has now been postponed until September. Uh, and so that people will need to, yeah, absolutely. I appreciate your mentioning this. I was at that meeting, or part of the meeting, and I think all it really was was that there was a, a budget number that had been changed but hadn't been changed in the document that was uh, provided so it didn't seem as if it was uh, a substantive policy thing that was holding it up as much yeah, as just something. I didn't that, get the sense that right, it was a substantive. I'm just sorry, I didn't updated. make you give that yeah. impression. I don't yeah. think it is a substantive change. I think that it's it's simply the nature, and and you as a council know that um, if the materials aren't clear in front of you, sometimes it's better to wait and to have that discussion. And so that discussion will happen now in September. Uh, I want people to save the date for National Night Out. It's, it's in just about two weeks, August 6th, Tuesday evening, uh, in front of Piney Branch Elementary School from 6 to 9 p.m. Um, please come out and enjoy. It is not true that I'm going to my vacation so I can avoid the dunk tank this year. Um, I enjoyed actually the dunk tank last year, but I, I'm not doing it this year, so <clears throat> somebody else needs to step in and, 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 and try it out. <laughs> I, I think you know. Ah. So. Oh, I my deputy needs to step in. Well, yes. Yeah, so there's that. So I anyway, it is an enjoyable get together. It was very nice last year, um, and so I I do hope people um, go out and enjoy, um, and and get to know the staff of our police department as well as the neighbors. Um, just a, one more note about um, last night's film screening. I think we had about 250 people in this building. This room was full. The cellular room was filled. Um, and um, I think that in a short period of time, there was some movement towards meeting the goal of providing a safe space for people to listen, critique, discuss, and learn from each other. I learned some things through this process um, that I really appreciated hearing from a variety of uh, views. And I, and I do agree with Council Member Kovar that one of the things that was very useful is it wasn't just like a two view point of view. There was at least four very distinct um, uh, perspectives that I heard. Uh, one of the um, panelists, uh, the representative from J Street did note that they're having an October conference to really go into these subjects. And uh, so people can go onto the J Street website um, and learn more about that October conference. Um, and it's jstreet.org. Um, and as the uh, mayor mentioned, uh, I'll be meeting with the Arts and Humanities Committee Commission on the 30th, their next meeting, uh, to begin talking about criteria for film selection, processes to go forward, 
and then I'd like to have those discussions with the council. So that's something to, to look forward to and to, uh, and to make something that makes, um, you know, good processes that make sense for us. We've got a list of our higher um, We are moving, f we are doing interviews again for HR directors, um, and that's um, been a little encouraging, so I'm, I'm happy, but we do, if anyone knows someone looking for a position, please go to our career section on the city webpage and, uh, and see if there's a good match uh, for an excellent candidate for an employment job with the city of Tacoma Park. Um, I do note that I will be on vacation August 1st through 12th, and I think the deputy city manager and I have one day to um, compare notes, and then he goes on his vacation. So we're looking forward to that. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, that now takes us to our work sessions this evening. Our first one is an overview of the library project and discussion of the architect's contract. So, um, thank you, Mr. Lukemeiger, I'm gonna turn it over to you. We do have uh, information also that was added to your package. It's this presentation as well as some answers to questions um, that have just been provided. And Greg Lukemeyer, architect, mm -hmm. please welcome. Oh, he needs oh I need to turn on your, you're good. No, 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 no. I, I want to introduce uh, Jason Fritz from AdTech uh, Civil Engineers, who um, I think can add uh, quite a bit from the conversation and presentation that you had last week from Bill Musico from uh, Montgomery County about floodplains. Uh, Jason was one of the authors of the floodplain study, and uh, frankly, together we have been developing the plans to make sure that we conform to all of the regulations and that the uh, mitigation of any impacts of the floodplain uh, will be present in the design. I brought a couple of slides from uh, the past just as a, a point of departure in case somebody would like to talk about it, but we're going to spend most of our time explaining, if you will, the impacts of the floodplain and what the next steps are. I got the impression I listened to uh, Bill Musico's presentation last week, and uh, I got the impression that most of the conversation was academic in terms of what a floodplain is, how one deals with it, how one is um, defined. Uh, but what he didn't get in, because quite frankly, he doesn't know that much about this particular project, was what does it mean to you folks? And what does it mean to the city of Tacoma Park and the library specifically? So Jason and I are, are gonna do a tag team on that. Um, because, like you, I'm a lay person when it comes to um, floodplains, and we don't build many buildings in floodplains, but you do when that's what's available. I'm going to explain to you very simply what I understand the whole process is. Jason is here to answer all the hard questions. And we actually received comments or questions from a number of uh, council people. We have answered them in writing, um, sent them to um, Ellen, the librarian, and Susie, and, and I think you all have them. Um, you all know what the existing library looks like. Um, you know, not sure if I, there's not a pointer here, so. Um, no, there's not a mouse either. Oh, doesn't look like it. In any case, you all know that where the front door is and where the current flood wall is around the library. And um, I'm not exactly sure even when that flood wall was constructed. Certainly it was not constructed with the original library. So that's something that we might want to talk about. And here's some photographs of that flood wall. Uh, the front door, as you know, is say facing Philadelphia Avenue, but the highest part of the site is obviously adjacent to the parking lot. And so the flood wall actually starts at about zero where it intersects with the parking lot and it grows to the, about two feet as it wraps around the library. 
Um, you all know about the inside of the library, and I'm going to just skip this for a, a moment. The, the latest or the initial proposal to enlarge the library from not quite 12,000 square feet to around 18 to 19,000 square feet did a number of things. It um, completed, in effect, that curved area to link the two arms of the L-shaped library, and it infilled the courtyard um, that where you can get in right now from the parking lot and infilled a little bit of the um, structural uh, piece that's on top of the underground parking. And so, in effect, con collectively, we identified potential areas in which to expand the library that we felt needed to, ex to be expanded from about 12,000 square feet to up to about 20,000 square feet. So all of these components uh, added up to about 19,000 square feet. And to be honest with you, because they were combined in that way, we began to have a very flexible shape. And that flexible shape enabled the library to be adaptable, to change over time, uh, to be open, uh, which is one of the things that people want in a library today. So flexibility was critical and it becomes somewhat of a community center. In fact, many librarians talk about libraries as the latest community center. Um, we conducted a floodplain with another consultant in, a in addition to Jason. And uh, this document, which I believe I showed you last time I was here, we talked about a couple of things, how a finished floor needs to be uh, approximately one foot above the stated floodplain. Although a floodplain study of some sort was developed when your, I'll say the rest of the community center was uh, constructed, we have not found any evidence that anybody has a copy of it, and nor does the county have any of the calculations uh, our background for what was determined and why, except there's a basic idea of where a floodplain was. And so the first step that, because we wanted to, you, you wanted to expand the library, was frankly to establish where the floodplain is and what its elevation is, so both from a horizontal standpoint as well as a vertical <coughs> standpoint. And because the site is not a tabletop, but it actually <coughs> slopes downward, as water goes, as you know, it's not going to keep level. It's going to follow the contours of the land that it is on. And so as the site slopes down, the height or the elevation of the floodplain slopes with it. Because the community center and the theater is on a lower part of the site, the elevation of the floodplain is not as high as it is at the library. So in effect, what Jason and his team determined was both the extent and the height of the floodplain. And that's kind of what Bill talked about last week. You know, we've defined a floodplain, we know what the height is, and now the issue is, what do we do about it? And yes, ma'am. Clarific a point of clarification. So when you go outside, there's no stream. But this is a, I effectively a historic floodplain with the stream channelized Correct. through pipes yeah. underneath. Correct. It's, Just, it's, it's not I a, think not it's, everybody It's was, not a historic stream. It's the topography of the hills around us, and the water comes down here and heads towards Sligo Creek. So it's, I, I wanted to be clear, I think there was a misunderstanding last week. It, there's not a historic stream that this is really talking about. This, this really has to do with the land topography. So one of the reasons why Bill talked about what he did last week and that the floodplain investigation was not complete is because this has been established with what's there today, that 12,000 square foot library. So if, in fact, we add 6,000 more square feet to the library, and in fact, infill a little bit more land, the next question he's going to have is, all right, does that extra 6,000 square feet change the elevation of the floodplain? Very simple. 
And that is the follow-up question that we're facing now. It doesn't change any of the basic principles of a floodplain or how one deals with it. So, and, and if I can, I think one of the, the critical things too that we discussed was that um, if it changes the height of the floodplain, the issue is does that have an impact on private property elsewhere? Yes, and, I, and I'm about ready to so, turn this over yeah. to Jason because you now know everything I know. <laughs> Um, and, and so when we met last time and we talked about the fact that because the library floor level needs to be raised, and right now the roof is it's only a couple of feet above the floor level, so if you raise the floor level, you don't have any headroom anymore. And the basic decision was discussed about taking down the library and replacing it, it enabled collectively all of us to say, all right, let's start with a new floor level that's a foot above the floodplain. And then the issue is, where is the new floodplain with the extra 6,000 square feet? So I don't think the, the next slide really just says this exactly what I said. So I'm going to uh, turn this over to Jason either to add to what I just said or to answer questions. <laughs> You're on. So you guys have a, a Jason Fritz, thanks for having me tonight. I appreciate it. Um, I, I watched the video as well. I think Bill with DPS, Bill Musico with DPS did a wonderful job. Uh, this is very technical stuff, and it's very hard to break that down into layman's terms sometimes. Um, but in, in the course of his explanation, there were a number of things that he discussed. Um, when we talk about floodplain mitigation there are several things and I just want to make that clear some of the questions that you all had at the end of the presentation and some of the comments that we received afterward it seems like maybe there was some misunderstanding about what the different types of flood proofing are uh, currently as the building exists at the lower level where the police station entrance is there is a um, what we call a passive flood wall Okay, and what happens with that is as, the, as things begin to happen, water starts to not go into the storm drain below grade, and it starts to flow above grade, this wall goes up to prevent water from flooding the police station, the lower level of the building. Okay, that's, con that's considered passive. Again, it's, Bill described it, um, and it, there's basically not human interaction. Um, you know, it's automatic. There are, are a couple other other types. Dry flood proofing, which is, forget about the door, assume that that was just a wall there, the flood wall that we're talking about. The concrete wall that goes around the perimeter of the building on the low side, that's called dry flood proofing. And what that is, is basically we're establishing the wall elevation above the flood pane elevation. So it's static, it never moves. If the, the water elevation is determined to be this, it's never gonna get up to that that high mark elevation. Uh, there's one other item uh, that we talk about is wet flood proofing. This is not really an option for this project, but I, I thought I'd discuss it. Uh, a lot of times, and, and the best example I can give for, for wet flood proofing is, is go down to the eastern shore, the houses are typically on piles or you know wood uh, beams, concrete beams, where they're up above grade. As the surf increases and comes in that water goes below the building where all of the living spaces are and then you know as that wave subsides and, and settles back down you're basically still left with the building intact okay yeah maybe there's some stuff that floated around underneath uh, somebody can safely you know stay in the building when there is some some type of uh, you know emergency um, to kind of break that down a little bit more there are some houses that you know are within a floodplain that the finished floor is where it needs to be above the floodplain and they may have a crawl space or a basement or something like that what uh what wet flood proofing allows is basically they have these flood vents and they allow water to go into the basement and then as the water goes away you know there's a sump pump that will slowly get that water out, but the water can basically flow below, similar to the uh, previous example that I used. And these things basically, they have 
they're in the, the foundation wall. They have a float, so when the water comes up, this float kind of picks it up and it, and it kicks it out. The water flows in, the water flows out, it subsides. At some point over the next 24 hours, your sump pump or whatever, you know, assuming that the electricity's on or you have a generator, pumps the water out of the basement. Um, there are, I mean, FEMA, you know, the whole thing that FEMA set up with the flood insurance rate is all based on this, you know, saving property, saving lives, those kind of things, and establishing these baselines for uh, uh, properties and uh, hab habitable quarters ab above the floodplain. So I just, I just wanted to point that out um, just to kind of tie on to what Greg was talking about with the the floodplain study that we're doing compared to the one that was done previously that again, mysteriously there's a plan that shows a line, there's no other backing to it. Again, I, I think that's a transition from paper to where we're now in a digital age. Um, at, at some point over the last you know decade or whatever, DPS has taken all of their hard files and transferred that. Some stuff has decent quality when it was recorded, some of it wasn't. Some of it got lost in translation. Um, but what I wanted to get at was, other than that line, we didn't have any base data. So we wanted, we wanted to go back on your behalf. I'm sorry? Yes. So, so what we wanted to do was, I don't want to just assume what this person's done. They may have missed something. You know, we want to go back and make sure or is this apples to apples? Are we talking about apples and oranges? Did they miss a whole uh, large area of drainage that comes into this overall drainage area? We want to make sure that we're pretty much on the same page as this previous study had. Is the flood wall at the right elevation? Is it too low? You know, is it uh, is it too high? Do we need to do anything at all? So, so what we've done to this point is kind of reestablish that to make sure we're within, you know, a little bit. And I feel like we're not too far off from what the original plan had. It's, it's a little higher, um, but it's close. So, you know, I feel like we have a good base set of data to work towards. So now that we've established that and we can say, okay, now we've done all of this work to determine what the real existing condition is, now we can move forward with as Greg said, the additional square footage of the building. You know, if we were to, um, um, and I'm drawing a blank, the, the, the name of the road that connects on the side here. Phil, no, not Philadelphia, the other one. Maple Avenue. Is it Ma Maple that runs up and down on this picture that we're looking at on the right hand side of the building? Oh, Grant, that's Grant Avenue. Grant, okay, yeah, Grant. If we, just below that, you can see how the, the limits of the floodplain really starts to neck down. That has to do with there's um, some grade difference and there's more elevation for that water to go and it flows faster. You guys know when you put your hose against the, the driveway and the water kind of spreads out and goes down, you know, it's low flowing. Whereas if you were to put it in a ditch or something like that, you know, it's gonna combine and, and, and do that. So I'm trying to give you some relationships. Um, on the left-hand side of the building, per the image we're looking at, everything's a lot flatter. That's why this is so spread out so far. So, you know, as we start going down towards Sligo Creek, everything gets more confined to a, a smaller area. If we were to build a dam across the road there, you know, the water's just going to pull up until it can get around that. Okay, so what we're talking about here with the building addition is if we build the building in there, the water's got to go somewhere. So, you know, we put the building addition in, again, depending on the size of it, and I cater to say that it's not a, a, a significant impact, but we don't know that yet. We really need to look at putting that in, running the numbers. Hey, it, it, are we raising the water elevation just a little bit, you know, or um, are we significantly damming this area such that water upstream of it onto adjacent residential properties or commercial properties, you know, you know, public properties, you know, are we creating a, a worse impact? That's, that's the goal of, the, of these floodplain studies and permitting, is to look at here's the existing condition or current condition. And when we look at the existing condition, current condition, it doesn't necessarily mean everything that's there. We look at the ultimate land use. So we're taking, and you know, Tacoma Park's developed. I mean, there's not going to be a whole lot 
a lot more that's coming coming down uh, the road, uh, you know, as far as commercial real estate and those kind of things. So, um, you know, the study that was prepared previously with their base data for the land uses and what we're using now is, is going to be more or less the same. Even though I don't have that information, I can say without questioning that, you know, that kind of data hasn't changed. Some uh, Bill mentioned like NOAA Atlas 14. Some of that information has updated over the last couple of years. The software that we use now is, you know, better than whenever this study was prepared back in the early 2000s or 90s, whenever it was. I don't, can't remember off uh, the top of my head. Um, and the, one of the biggest things that's happened between then and now is the, the GIS data that was used during that time frame and where we are now, I mean, it's compounded exponentially. You know, we have much more accurate data about what the, what the actual ground is today than we did back when that was prepared. That a lot of quad maps and those kind of low level detail maps were used to prepare that old document. I think the bottom line of <clears throat> I think the bottom Sorry, line of all this is there's <clears throat> absolutely nothing wrong with building in a floodplain. It's how we deal with the floodplain and to make sure that um, any design mitigates any potential problem that there might be. So um, it's not whether it's how you how you deal with it. So. And I think Bill said that last week as well. Just to, mm -hmm. just a point of clarification, so that <coughs> the hundred-year floodplain map, which is the slide just before this, was done when? Just did it last. Mm -hmm. the, the the one that we're looking at on the screen here. No, you're talking that's about the floodplain study. You referred to something done in the 2000s. So 2005, yeah. when this building was was being expanded and and we connected to the library, a, a floodplain delineation study was done at that right, time. I, so I think that's about 2005, yeah, I believe. Yeah, 2006. Mm -hmm. And that's um, the first map. That's not. We do not we don't have, have that it. on here. We don't have it. But the but that we do have some drawings of it, but we don't have any of the data that that it came from. Do you have the report? We don't, we don't have even the, have a written report. We don't report. have the report from the previous study. There's, it's, everything is not there. So when you, when you, we, the, the clarification question is, when you said that you ground truthed it, I assumed that these two maps were slightly different and they came from two different places. So where did the first one come from? If it that, didn't okay, come so from so I, let me just there's some clarification. Let me can I give some clarification because I think I can answer your question, uh, Mr. Siemens. The 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 floodplain study for this property was done for the project when we expanded the community center. Right. We also did in 2009 a larger study about floodplains down to Sligo Creek and that kind of thing, and we do have that report. Okay. That, that was not done to the same kind of detail that is needed for a particular property. And, yeah. and, and what, that's this first what, map. No, the, they're the I'm, same. <coughs> they're the same drawing. They're the same drawing. Okay. The two are the same. Slide. Thank you. All right, so maybe if we took a moment to ask questions regarding the floodplain, and then Mr. Lukemeyer will turn mm -hmm. it back to you on that. Um, and I, as we noted, um, there were a number of questions um, after last week that city council members um, submitted. A lot of them were repetitive of each other. Um, and so thank you for responding. But are there any other questions regarding the floodplain specifically that we could answer now before moving on? Councilmember Smith, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, if, if we did everything you said, Mr. Lukemeyer, about making sure that we uh, build this structure if we go forward that will cover every potential flooding uh, possibility would that be within the budget that we are talking about right now or does that change things no that's what we have proposed okay uh, if I can yes I'm sorry I just I just want to be clear on this we're talking about the hundred years flood right Right. Not the 5,000 here. Right. Not, <laughs> not, right. not we're getting together to build an arc. I just, right. Because there are 500 year mm -hmm. studies, there are other things, and I just wanted to clarify. Okay, good. Uh, and the other thing is, 
do you see any unintended consequences by raising this library and what it would do to this building? It should not affect this building at all. You're talking about the existing yes. community center. No, right. it should not affect the building at all. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Kostick. Thank you very much. These are um, useful. It's a useful discussion to have, and I have a lot of questions that may not be very well formulated, so I apologize in advance. Um, so building on my colleague's question, in terms of how this impacts the community center, not so much the new building per se, but what you found through the floodplain study looking at the library, did you find um, issues that we need to be concerned about related to this building? And would you recommend further study based on that? So what, what we did determine during our study was that the, the community center is actually above the elevation that we found. And um, Greg was kind of going through that, you know, from one side of the site to the other side of the site, the, the ground and uh, Bill Musica referred to as the, the water profile. What we're talking about is, you know, even though there's three feet of water here and three feet of water here, it's at a different elevation because, again, you're going down grade. Okay, based on all of the, the initial study that we've done, the community center is above the floodplain, which means, you know, right now, not doing anything would, we'd be compliant. There wouldn't be anything necessarily to worry about again if it's within that 100 year flood. Mm -hmm. uh, I do understand that there have been some issues with water coming in the, the front door and stuff. And there, you know, we're ho I'm not really sure how that relates to any of this. But, um, you know, as part of the development of the library, some of those things we would incorporate in to try and mitigate. And I, I, if I can just address that also, and, and I know uh, Ms. Braithwaite is here, it, part of the discussion too, it can be just like a small thing that can cause flooding. It can be, we've, I remember when I first started here, we had flooding in this building because a manhole cover was down in the sewer and it was blocking things up. So. Um, part of this, part of there is maintenance, part of it is the grading of the parking lot behind this building. Um, but the other thing is we're, you know, if we learn something else, we would, we would bring that back to you. But a lot of the day-to-day -day issues are maintenance and just making sure that we have a good site, a clean site. I also wanted to understand, I'm, I'm confused about the issue of this being a stream, a historic stream versus they're being run off during a storm. What is it that would cause the flooding and the floodplain issues here? So I'm, I'm using a double-edged sword here, but um, if you looked at old historic photos before Tacoma Park was here, mm -hmm. there's essentially a ravine. You know, again, all the roads and everything have been kind of built in to meet the topography. Okay, so water naturally came down that way. Over the years, as the, the city was developed, um, there's a pretty significant storm drain system that runs below Philadelphia Avenue that runs down to Sligo Creek. Okay, while that storm drain system is significantly large, it is not large enough to convey the entire 100-year storm. So, um, again, Bill Musico talked about this in that the when we look at floodplains, we assume, you know, more of a catastrophic type thing where the storm drains clogged, you know, there's erosion and silts got in there, trees has gotten a storm drain and it's completely clogged. You know, you mentioned the, the manhole. We're, we're assuming that there's no relief to go for water in the storm drain and it's all flowing above grade. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's, that's helpful. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then my final question is, in terms of what needs to be done still for the floodplain study, how does that interact with the building plans? And at this point in time, are we far enough along in the floodplain study to be able to approve the contract so that you move forward with the building plans? At this point, um, and what perhaps, let's see if I can go back a couple of slides. If, in fact, what you see on this slide becomes the maximum area that you could ever expand the library, both because of the retention of the landscaping as well as just the physical limitations of a site, 
then yes, we can establish the fact that the library will be no larger than this. And then we can go ahead and in effect prepare a site plan and do the calculations and submit it to begin to get responses from the county. Frankly, without designing the, the, the library any more than saying, here's the footprint, we're going to bring walls up and we're going to put a roof on it. I mean, that's not a design, but it establishes the limits and the outside limits of what might happen. The floodplain study has nothing to do with the height of the library, it's simply the footprint. So if this becomes the maximum, and you could actually make it a little bit smaller if that became an issue, then we've gone far enough to know what the potential impacts would be. To, to, to add on that, uh, you know, the, the goal at this point for the architect is to get it to a design level that he feels comfortable that the exterior walls aren't going to move around. Okay, programmatically, you know, we have everything that we want, those type of things, because once we start this floodplain process, any change to that building footprint or any additional grading, ramps, sidewalks, those kind of things are just going to kind of, you know, make us take steps back as we work through the process. Um, to get in the weeds a little bit with the permitting, the way that this happens is the floodplain study, including all the proposed improvements, the limit of that floodplain has to be approved before we can really move forward with any permitting at all. That's the first thing that has to happen. So uh, part of the requirement is that the on the NRI, the natural resource inventory, which is the first step in the permitting process, we have to show the approved floodplain on that document. So, you know, again, we're putting the cart ahead of the horse a little bit, but making sure that the site and all the improvements that are happening on the site um, are correct at this point in time helps us to get through those first things. And then a lot of the permitting just falls hand in hand. Um, at that point, you know, the set sediment control plan, when we go for, for that permit, stormwater approvals. Um, one of the other things that I'll note is you're, we're not allowed to do stormwater management within floodplain areas. So again, developing where the, that is and determining based on the improvements we do, how we're going to treat stormwater. You know, we really got to have all that stuff up front before we get into all the bits and pieces of everything. Mm -hmm. And so the work that you would be doing on the building plan, you're not necessarily looking to redesign something with a different Correct. overall overarching design. And you're kind of getting into the nitty gritty yeah, and determining the square footage. Yeah, in fact, one of the footage. things we did is subsequent to our last presentation, we worked with the library and within this shape, you know, have developed a number of different ways of laying out the library. And that's why I came back and said, it's so critical for us to be flexible. Mm -hmm. So that within, in big quotes, the box, the floor plan can be manipulated in terms of where toilets are, where the circulation desk is, where stacks. And so there are any number, I think we presented six different ways of organizing the library. And there are two that seem to come out on top. So we hope that we have gone through enough of the process to ensure that the, the perimeter of the building would not change. Thank you. Great. Council Member Kovar. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. And, and it's great to hear from you, Mr. Fritz, also. So it sounds like from what you're saying, we have the design for the library moving along and then the, the floodplain work. And there, neither one is at a complete point yet, but that they both sort of are interconnected to each other. Is that is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, yeah. Again, at at, at some point, some of the site development again has to come ahead of the building. I was, I mean, I think in my response and even talking with uh, Greg, we don't need to know what the carpet is. We don't know what mm -hmm. to, the, the furniture is at this point in time. Right. So you know, the wall partitions, those yeah. kind of things. As long as that exterior set. We got enough to move forward. So if that's true, then, um, I mean, does it make sense to sort of say, okay, we'll agree with the uh, external footprint, I think is what you call it, Greg, mm -hmm. knowing that we could vary that. Agree on that, finish the floodplain, and then after that go to the detailed design? Is that, I mean, is there a yes. logic to that? or there, That is something that could happen. But would that change? What would that change? It, if in fact, in the big picture, if Jason and I started at the same time, yeah. Now, it takes him about a year to get a site plan approved. 
to go through all the process. It normally takes us eight to 12 months to put all the documents together for a building. So if he started early, you know, the drawings may follow his work by a couple of months at the other end. So that's the implication. There may be an offset in terms of rather than finishing on the same day, he may get a permit a couple of months before the actual documents are finished to go out to bid. But normally, um, the two things are going along at the same time. Usually but but, but then if something big, <coughs> big happens with the floodplain that, that forces a change, then what happens? That's, the value, that's pr probably the advantage of starting the site plan right away and getting into it far enough so that you get some feedback so that you're, none of us are surprised and holding off perhaps uh, of the building design for a couple of months while he prepares the first, the next, the next submission to the county. The county won't do anything until they see a site plan for the proposed building. That's why Bill couldn't respond to anything. Mm -hmm. All he was yeah. responding is, oh yeah, they established the floodplain. But until they see a site plan of exactly the building, sidewalks, roads, that sort of stuff, they're not even going to comment or respond to, mm -hmm. to us. So I think, if I might, so one of the um, areas that I think I, I heard kind of mentioned in here is, is really being careful about the exterior elements of the wall. And I know um, part of the reason that you need to do some interior design is to make sure you know where the doors and the ramps right. and those mm -hmm. kinds of things right. are. So there has to be some interior work to at least be comfortable enough where it affects the outside walls. Am I, am yes, I right about fact, that? One of the things that we did in, in uh, both of these options is that we moved the door, the front door, which is halfway up here on the left, as close to the community center as possible, where the floodplain is the lowest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to take advantage of that. And so as we said that, all right, let's start with the door here. Let's see how far we can move it up. How does, how does the library then unfold? Since the door would be a natural potential entry point for yes. water if, if that was happening. Yeah, so we're trying our best to make sure that <coughs> we're not putting a door where there's the highest potential of an issue, but the lowest potential of any issue that might happen. So together, we have to also make sure the library works. So that's an investigation that happened over the last couple of months where we investigated how the library might work with the best location for a door and the, uh, the maximum size of a library. Is that it, Councilmember Kovar? Well, I guess just the thing I'm sort of grappling <laughs> with, and I'm sorry to, to just be sitting here pondering, sorry. is, you, you know, what's the, the right timing to approve how much of the design could I, work? Could I just to, suggest to one thing? Yeah. Um, could we just wrap up maybe general questions on floodplain and then talk about process? Because sure. I think That's then, what I'm pondering. I, I, yeah, okay. no, I, I think then once we answer all the questions on the flood planks. I see Councilman Dabala still has a hard light on. And then maybe we'll wrap that up and then we'll talk about and let Mr. Luke Meyer kind of walk us through the process because I think that might answer okay. maybe I, some I'm, of your questions. That's fine. Cool. Councilman Dabala. Thank you. Um, so I, going back a little bit, I thought I heard you two say slightly different things. <laughs> so I thought one of you said let's establish the maximum footprint. And I thought the other one of you said, let's set the footprint. And so that's my question. When you do the study that informs the county approval, do you need the firm footprint or do you need the maximum footprint? Hopefully it's and, the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I ask is because there are a couple of modular pieces in here, as mm -hmm. you said. And, and in, when we start to look ahead at costs, they may or may not. So that's, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, Jason really should not start until we establish what the footprint of the building is. Mm -hmm. okay. So if somebody said, gee, let's push this piece in, let's do this, let's do that, then that would establish the footprint of the building. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions, Councilman Navalny? Uh, no, no, thank you. Okay, not Councilman right Searcy. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, so one question I have is how the floodplain and the stormwater management kind of jive, right? Um, <coughs> so as we're thinking about um, mitigation plans in terms of the flood, flood plain, so let's say we've established the footprint of the building, we know we're gonna elevate it to a certain point, so we're above the floodplain, but I would assume that we would still need to have some sort of water mitigation to happen. So then is that a part of the flood management plan if we are above above the floodplain, or would that be like stormwater management? And how does that work? <clears throat> that's, that's a good question. So uh, the 100-year floodplain is more or less a conveyance issue. It's, it's water getting from one place to another for the 100-year storm, mm -hmm. okay? Typically, we design for the 10-year storm event for storm drain pipes, those kind of things. Um, and again, there's a conveyance issue, but the, the water, the amount of water getting to those systems are a lot smaller than the 100 year. Um, so you have, and, and again, they're both conveyance. One, one's just at a much larger magnitude, okay? So when we're, we're talking about conveyance, that may fall into, um, you know, what the capacity of the existing system is based on the storm event that we're designing for the site. Again, the site design from a water quality standpoint is the one-year storm event. From a water quantity standpoint, is a 10-year event. But then we also have the floodplain, which is kind of independent of those two things. Water quality, we're taking the dirty water and we're making it cleaner, cooling it down before it gets into our natural resources. Um, quantity management, which may be you know a pond or a uh, or a detention facility above grade or an underground stormwater facility. When I say stormwater, I mean detention facility, stores water and releases it at a very slow rate. Okay, the pipe downstream may be at full capacity, and we're trying to get let that water get down, so we're letting water out very slowly until this subsides, and then the the water stormwater that's on the site can get into that system and go on its merry little way. Mm -hmm. Stormwater management with the water quality items. Again, I was talking about cleaning the water, making it dirty. Um, let me try it again. Make Dirty it water, water, making it clean. <laughs> um, those, those, you know, part of that is any any development that we do that's new, uh, new impervious, replacement impervious. We have to treat those areas from a quality perspective, okay. and you know that's set forth by the state, um, the the city. You know, you guys approve stormwater management here. The county approves sediment control. The county approves the floodplain. Um, the water quality items, you know, we would need to, once the floodplain's established, we would need to look at, okay, the, the new building that we're putting in, the building, the roof area, how are we going to treat that? How are we going to treat that outside of the floodplain? Mm -hmm. What can we do to, you know, do that and still keep, do we treat other areas of the site in lieu of treating the building? You know, so we're basically, if this is this square footage and I want to treat it, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to. We might not be able to. We might want to look at another area of the site and treat that and say, okay, we're, we're basically swapping an equivalent area. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of jumped around all over the place. I'm going to go back and just say, again, we're talking about three things here. There's the floodplain study, which is a big, big conveyance thing. We're getting water, large amounts of water from a high point to a low point. There is on-site detention management for the 10-year event mm -hmm. and then there's water quality which is the one-year storm again we're we're trying to clean the water thank you no we're dealing with sidewalks so i, I now kind of understand that a little bit better so that that actually made sense to me so okay <laughs> all right thank you that was really well done thank you <laughs> <laughs> no i actually think that was i cleared up a lot of questions i had yeah. councilman Devala. yeah it did knock a bunch off my list but i i want to just make sure that i understand this so if so we do if 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 you do the impact of a building that's the ex and I'm not saying we're going to do this but if the if the design was the exact same footprint as we're, what we have now and then then there wouldn't be any additional impact we already know it's a foot is that right 
and and if Go we <laughs> so if let me make sure I want to clarify that I understand you correctly. You're talking about essentially we leave all the walls, the roof, and everything, and where just they are. And I'm not saying renovate we're doing the that. interior just, of the building. Yeah, I'm That's just it. asking. Like if we do nothing, we then you change wouldn't, the windows. You wouldn't need a site plan. Nothing. We wouldn't have to go through the floodplain. We wouldn't have to get a floodplain permit. Um, you know, there would it would just be like an interior uh, tenant fit out. Okay, more or less. so I mean, it and, right. it would, and, and it would remain below the floodplain. And it would be, and we would know now what we didn't know before. Right. That, yeah. Okay. And like I said, I'm not wanting to do that. I'm just clarifying what it is that actually triggers all this stuff. So we are proposing to add to the footprint. And so now we have to look at the additional impact of that extra footprint. Okay. Um, and the assumption, do you have an assumption about whether the floodplain is going to rise significantly as a result of the 8,000? Uh, again, I, I, don't, I don't have an you don't assumption know, you have at this to run point the numbers. You know, it, may, it may go up in significantly. You know, that's the best case scenario. Right, could but we don't know. A quarter of an inch. Yeah, it could right. go up a quarter so of an inch. So if it goes a bit insignificantly, then that doesn't add too much. So what, what, what the floodplain criteria says is right. that you're not al allowed to increase the 100-year flood elevation by more than a tenth of a foot. Right. So when we talk about a tenth of a foot, I'm an engineer, I know what that means. We're talking about an inch, an inch and a quarter, or something like that. It's pretty insignificant. I'm fairly yeah. certain with the small addition that's mm -hmm. being put onto the building okay. that you know we're not going to raise the flood elevation two feet or anything like that. And add now, significantly. Where that is, okay. you know, again, an inch is insignificant. Is it going to be below, above? I'm not sure. Is it two inches, five inches? But it's not a couple of feet. It's right. not in your estimation right now, what you know, not going to add huge additional costs because we have to put it up even right. that much higher. That was well, again, we've established the baseline of what the elevation is. Right. We know that we can't increase it more than a tenth higher than that. Okay. So, you know, that, that's it. That's it. We could develop the whole thing, but somehow we've got to figure out how to get that water around the building mm -hmm. without impacting businesses, private properties upstream. And what that may mean is, you know, more storm drain, additional grading, uh, you know, th those kind of things to help. That was the last question is what does it mean? Go ahead. Yeah, that, that's what it means is, you know, we got to figure out some other method to, to again, leave the floodplain elevation upstream in the same condition that it is currently. Okay. And again, like I said, it, it there's a, a lot of different options you could look at and there's dollar signs, you know, one dollar sign versus four dollar signs with every option that we look at. We, we did spend some time looking at multiple things. Um, you know, clearly adding a significantly sized storm drain uh, from the, the library all the way down to Sligo Creek is not the most economical choice. Um, you so know, and disruption to the community, et cetera, et cetera. When we talk about the cost table, can we come back to what assumptions, if any, are about, about the floodplain treatment are built into this other than the one foot increase? Thank you. All right, so we're good on floodplain questions? <laughs> All right, so um, I think we just had a question from Councilwoman Dabala. So before we go into process, maybe we should go to the assumptions you built into the cost page if we wanna, you went over that the last time you were here, but do you wanna extent, do that? The, yeah. the basic assumption is that wherever that floodplain is, we're gonna be raised above mm -hmm. it. And so we have estimated that we would need to raise the library floor about 10 inches. Okay. Currently, the community center is 10 inches above the library. Yeah. So by raising the library 10 inches, you know, you're a little bit, you're not exactly where the existing community center is, but you're not too far off of that. So that's the basic assumption, that we simply raise the floor slab. So additional conveyance and and, it goes all, and, the, and grading and all of those things are not built into this right now. Correct. Uh, no, I thought they were. No, no. They, so there is some. There yeah. is some because that some. because yeah. what we what we looked at was um, we we did look for at one point what would happen if we had to like really do regrading mm -hmm. to to really change where the yeah, that, the the flood would go. And, and we determined that um, 
it wouldn't take all of that. So the, the question that I think that is still outstanding is if after running these numbers, it was higher than that tenth of a foot, is that the, that's the criteria, that then we, uh, we would need to show where that goes on our property and, and how that's graded so that the conveyance could continue mm -hmm. and not raise the water, right? Yeah. And that cost is not in here. We have not changed the site or the parking lot to, let's say, make the storm, the channel wider. So, so yes, I think the assumption was that the adding of the square footage and raising the building, raise, and raising, raising the, but, the building but adding the it. adding the square footage would not impact the floodplain outlines more than that. Correct. Than that amount. That's correct. And so that's and what we would need to come back to to be assured of. And there is some, I think, it, some inherent dollar signs in there again if we're raising the building obviously right there's just that. right at the entrance to try and get into the building would need to be changed or augmented right, right. so we we calculated that but not something significant so if yeah. something significant would found we have to come back and right so if you that. just go advance to slide seven I think it is it's just so everyone knows what we're looking at yeah this what, is this is what this is yeah what, we're what we about. looked at a number of different options one is simply to raise <coughs> the floor mm -hmm. okay and let the water, wherever it is today, it continues, and so be it. The second was to totally modify the parking lot and push the retaining wall back mm -hmm. toward the school, in effect, widen the channel so that the water has more area in which to spread out, which has the effect of lowering the floodplain. That, pushing that back, Building not, lower, not necessarily lowering it, just making it go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. That's you. all. So we're filling. So essentially, you're creating this island in between, and two streams are yep. going around. Right. But and we found that was very expensive mm -hmm. to do that and disruptive. And of course, we we looked at demolishing, constructing uh, something new. When we first looked at just raising the floor and renovating it. We hadn't thought through that very well because if you just raise the floor and renovate what's there, you're going to end up with a seven and a half foot right. high ceiling. So don't waste your money. Yeah. In effect, you get nothing out of it. <clears throat> okay, Councilmember Smith, do you have a question? Yeah, in the estimated construction cost page, when you look at the assumptions and the addition, mm -hmm. <laughs> Why is the cost per square foot so significantly uh, more than the uh, library renovation? Well, the library renovation, you're not building a structure. You're not building mm -hmm. a roof. So with that 8,000, what can you show us on, where would that additional 8,000 square feet? It is, whoops, I'm see if I can get to the right location, I'm sorry. It's all the yellow mm -hmm. on this slide, slide four. Okay, and then uh, the new construction, what is that saying? Are you putting those together, the, the addition plus the new construction? Well, if it's a new building, you're starting from scratch. Okay, so, but that <laughs> number is $350. Correct. Per square foot. So only eight, adding 8,000 square feet is $375 a square foot. But you're the, saying if 8,000 square feet, is, it's not 8,000 square feet, it's almost, almost 20,000 square feet at $350 a square foot or 375. Does, does, so part of this is finally putting decent bathrooms and right. all of the, and, and you know building that because right now the bathrooms are not in the right place and they don't meet ADA requirements and that kind of thing and so the library renovation oh, would oh, keep I would, would keep I the see. locations in the same place but the a new construction allows some flexibility about how that's how that's handled yeah i'm sorry but i misunderstood I think, what but i the think maybe you was. can answer it because i yes so i'm just trying to understand here you know with the 8000 it's 375 and then 
you're saying you're going to build this whole new thing and it's 350. To be honest with you, it's a lot easier to build a new building mm -hmm. than to plug in all these little pieces and make it all work. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and that's a firm number. <laughs> it's the building's not designed. Okay. It's a budget figure that's fairly historically accurate at this okay. point. Okay. Historically accurate. I like that. Thank mm -hmm. you. What I can't tell you is when you go to bid what the market conditions will mm -hmm. be in the Washington metropolitan area. That's, that is part of the reason, though, as we go forward and, and we talk about the process, there's numerous times when we would be coming back to the council, and there's several times where we have better cost estimates. I mean, you go out and you have the cost estimate <coughs> involved as, as, the, as the specifications are more finalized, it's easier to get the cost estimators work. These are in-house numbers when we are going to go ahead with the new building. At each phase of the project, we hire an independent estimator because I don't believe in wishful thinking when it comes to estimating. And we give them the set of drawings. They work for contractors on bid day, so they estimate the building as it gets more and more developed. So they're usually very, very accurate. And so are you seeing um, costs right now in the DMV increasing significantly, or is it? Flat. They're they've been increasing ever since the last couple of years, and it all is a factor of the amount of work. Right. And um, it's very difficult to estimate two years ahead because nobody knows what the economy is right. going to be doing. Right. Um, so what we have to do is it's probably, and if I were smart, I probably would have given you a range, a little bit less and a little bit more. Because that's, I'm seeing what recent bids have been, and it all depends upon the finishes and the shape. And right, right. a building that's simple to build is less expensive than actually a bigger building that's simple to build is actually less expensive than a smaller building that's more articulated, for instance. So, you know, we're using our judgment to give you a sense of where we think this would be. Okay, thank you. Councilmember CC and then Damala. Um, so one area that, that I, I was a little confused about before um, was the other project costs and assuming the 20% of construction costs to include contingency along with furnishings and all of that other stuff. And I, I you know, I'm thinking about HGTV, which is totally file false. I get it. Um, <laughs> but usually you would have, you know, that contingency, the construction contingency itself being 20% of construction costs separate no. from like furnishings and all of those other things. That Probably not that much. Okay. We, we generally deal strictly in the actual construction costs. Every project, let's say Montgomery County, when they budget a project and you see what the number is in the newspaper, it's probably double what the actual construction cost is because <laughs> they have internal costs, whether it's yeah. fees, furnishings, insurance, legal fees, buying property, um, moving costs, whatever it is. So we can't estimate those at this point. We can estimate some of those, mm -hmm. but I don't want to not say what the truth is, that it's not just the construction cost. There's also a total project cost. And, and collectively, outside of like what the county would typically do, are you seeing that it would be safe to kind of assume 20% or is it something that's not even safe? It's just a, it's a question mark number that will be final. It's, it's kind of this black box that really needs us to get to the point where we're more we along with the design. We could probably get a little bit closer, but for instance, I don't know the moving costs right. or storage mm -hmm. costs. Right. I can tell you what furnishings cost per square foot mm -hmm. because we've done it so many times. I can tell you what, uh, you know, we can find out what the permit costs are. We can uh, estimate the testing when a testing company has to come in during construction and test all the welds on the steel, mm -hmm. you know, or concrete. They're doing cylinder tests for the concrete. So there are extra costs that are over above the bid costs that the contractor gives you on bid day. Is the library going to be temporarily relocated somewhere else or a smaller version of it? You know, we did that with Wheaton Library. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that thing's coming open here soon. But again, there's some costs associated with finding a place mm -hmm. 
how big is it going to be? Mm -hmm. Do you have to lease it? Staff yeah. moving inventory from there to the new location, staff moving inventory back to the new library. You know, a lot of those things, I mean, are not something that, that you know, we can really budget for. Mm -hmm. That's something internal that the, the I know. Season. We know our deputy senior manager is losing sleep over this, so don't worry. <laughs> he, he has it. <laughs> I hear about it weekly. <laughs> <laughs> weekly. So he's losing much sleep about it. So I know. <laughs> none, of us, none of us do. Um, no, that, that's helpful to that's helpful to hear. Thank you. Great. Uh, back to Councilwoman Dabala. Yeah, sir. I, the design the design is elegant, and the need is, to me, unquestioned that we need to do something. I'm just con obviously I'm concerned about the costs and the potential for them to escalate. Um, so I assume that you, the design that you've put forward. You would call that a simpler design relative to your comment a little while ago. In effect, yes. To, yeah, because but it's also a very conceptual design. Yeah, we really were retained to show expansions and some options. So it's not a final design. No, no. But no, there's nothing complicated about it. Right. So the curving and all that, do and the extra glass is not. That's still pretty simple. Glass not is more really expensive. Looks. Let's say brick and block. Mm -hmm. okay. Glasses. 60 to 80 dollars a square foot brick and blockers 30 to 40. so you begin as you have a budget and you have a design you work back and forth a part of our job is to meet your budget and so we may need to develop some more options and and the 20 percent um and the other project costs you're assuming is in in addition to the construction costs I stepped out of the room and I didn't yes. hear you say that. Yes. Okay. And then after that, following up on Councilmember Circe, Circe's comment, would you then recommend adding a contingency after that, or do you feel like that's built in there? And then one last question about costs. I'd want to spend a little bit more time mm -hmm. estimating what all those are. For instance, okay, I would see. estimate that there would always be a, con a construction mm -hmm. contingency in case mm -hmm. you find something underground right. or there's some issue going on. That actually range, we've been, we really strive to be two to three percent. I've seen people budget up to 10 percent. Mm -hmm. I think that's a lousy set of drawings. Mm -hmm. So there does need to be a contingency because none of us knows, even when you take soil borings, the problems are always between the two. Mm -hmm. They're not exactly where you do yeah. the boring. Yeah. And, and, if I, and if I can just interrupt on this, um, besides what's here, I mean, internally we've been, and what we presented during budget time, it also talks about some of the other costs, like mm -hmm. a construction manager to also that. oversee the details and that, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, so I just want to be clear that it's not like we haven't thought about it. That's part of what we talked about before. It's what's in the budget uh, documents, and it's <laughs> it's what we go back and forth with too. So, I, I just because it's not on this screen doesn't mean it's not in our documents, and it's not what we're thinking about. Yeah, and it's and it's within our budget. Yeah. One thing one thing that I'd like to add is you know any any construction project has these same same issues. You know mm -hmm. that you could have run into issue with with any kind of a, a bathroom renovation, for mm -hmm. instance. She, she mentioned HGTV. You watch stuff happen all the time. We got to move the beam. She is HGTV. So, um, so, you know, any, any project, not just one of this magnitude, but any other project, you know, what's going to happen in the next couple of years? Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, when uh, uh, you guys won't care about this, but when, when uh, Katrina hit, a lot of the PVC pipe is actually manufactured in the south. So mm. PVC pipe went up. It got very expensive, so we were actually looking at other uh, pipe materials to help offset some of the cost because you know the contractors, their subs who were supplying it had committed to this, and now we can't produce it. You know, and and some of those things, you know, you might have to step back and look at things a little differently, even as construction's going on, to help meet that ultimate uh, overall budget. That's mm -hmm. why I was asking about flexibility from right. the maximum. Right. Right. Well, we'll maybe we like, yeah yeah so maybe if we should go through the process a little bit because I think yeah. it would be helpful to know as we, what the process is moving forward <laughs> and when some of these costs are going to get when you start firming up some of the costs. Yeah. So can we, I ask one more question? Yeah, yeah. yes. So if could we go back to the cost chart for just a minute that we were just on? 
so I'm just curious what the difference is between the new construction amount um, 6.8 million and the the total construction for option three which is 7.5 million the green so what's the difference that's, Not, that's the renovation patient. of the rec department that's part of what we've talked about is that this implies especially if you're changing the floor level and whatever mm -hmm. it, it makes sense to deal with um, some changes in the rec department space because it's not good space either right now. So that's the difference. You see 688, 687,500, that's in that um, third to the right column. But it still doesn't seem to add up all the way, right? I'd have to check my Excel spreadsheet. Should we do the, the, the 50, the, the two? With the 405,000? And then, then the 250,000, too. These two give me this. Okay. So the other question is, I'll look back at the numbers later, but. My recollection, and I'll have to look back at this, but was that the earlier amounts at the time we were doing the bonding and so on, that the, that the figure included some of the things like the uh, contingency and the permitting and so on, not the furnishings and the moving and temporary facilities. So am I misremembering that? I'm not entirely sure. We generally talk in terms of, as I said, construction costs. And I suspect that what happened early on is we were talking construction, but not the whole project cost. And then we were asked to, you know, there's, there are more costs than just the construction. Let's add those things in so we can uh, but if I, get if more I'm, focused. That's true. But the other part of this is that we have the up to $3 million in the cable grant mm -hmm. funds. That, so when we were looking at how, what was the appropriate amount to borrow, we, we, we didn't want to, to borrow a larger amount. We knew that the, some of this would be offset with cable grant funds. Mm -hmm. it, and on that point, what would that money be used to, to cover? So we can use the cable grant capital funds for things that um, advance um, activities that City TV gets involved mm -hmm. with and a lot of the um, wiring and other kinds of things. For, so for example, even the room that, is, oh, that would be suspended over the parking lot, uh, which would be a wonderful place for a variety of gatherings that City TV would use, as well as just gatherings. But it's something that the funds for building that could come from that capital grant the computer room areas of the library could easily come and be justified with that capital grant funds. A lot of the connections of the program space in the library would be able to be used with that. So that we, we're anticipating using that as best we can. Mm -hmm. So it's not just it's not just equipment, it's actual mm -hmm. construction. Oh yes, because yeah, yeah. we right. we can use it for construction. Right. Yeah. Uh, Councilman Caustic and then we'll go back to the process. I just have a quick question. Would it be possible, and maybe you've already done this and I'm not remembering it, but would it be possible to get a document that shows all of the expenses, not just the construction mm -hmm. costs, but also what we've already spent, the contract, the floodplain, all of those different expenses? Thank you. Great process. Okay. The general architectural process, and this is what we would follow with Montgomery County or any of the other jurisdictions, a, a design process includes three design phases, what's called a schematic design, a design development phase, and then the construction documents phase. The schematic design takes kind of what we've done and establishes the floor plan, the basic building appearance, and uh, defines kind of what the mechanical system might be, the structural system. So it, it basically is a, it establishes, establishes the scope of the project. And that generally is a two month process, plus or minus, about two months. The next phase is design development. And that takes the schematic, and at the end of schematic design, we pull our first independent estimate. There's enough there from a site plan standpoint, from a building design standpoint, um, to do a schematic estimate. And the estimator generally puts a 15% contingency on that 
um, number because not the whole, the whole thing isn't drawn. We go then to the design development phase and that makes the building real. It actually establishes the structural system. It establishes the mechanical electrical system. It, we draw um, the column grids. We show the distribution. We do an energy analysis. Um, we show furnishings, once again, to prove that everything works. We establish finishes. We um, show all the doors. We show the frames. We show all the windows. So it takes that schematic idea and turns it into something real that the estimator can, can estimate. He does another estimate. He usually puts a five to seven and a half percent contingency on that because it's not finished. Then we go to construction documents and construction documents are the, the drawings and specifications that are sent out for bid to the contracting community. That's the actual detailed drawing of the architectural work, the mechanical, the electrical, the plumbing, fire protection, structural, site plan, all those components. And that'll probably in the, be in the neighborhood of 125 to 130, maybe up to 150 drawings. You know, a thick set of drawings that establishes everything that we can establish and it coordinates everything. And we now draw that in, in it, what's called building information modeling, which is a three-dimensional drawing program. And we actually build the building as we draw it. And so we can actually find out where the conflicts are between that beam and that duct going through it. And it's cut down on changes during um, construction. We issue the, the backgrounds to all of our consultants and they all have to draw on that same format. And uh, in addition to the drawings, we write a book of specifications, which is anywhere from three to 500 pages. And it goes through every product in the building. And it specifies how that product should operate. It's both a qualitative and a quantitative um, identification. And it generally lists three products that will meet those specifications. Anytime we do public work, we cannot be proprietary and say it has to be this guy. Unless, and some jurisdiction says, well, you know, I have an energy management system and all the other buildings, say Montgomery County, use Johnson Controls with this type of energy management system. That's what's going in the next building, too. And they will tell us it has to be that system. So whether you folks have something like that or not, I don't know at this point. We're too early in the game. Some jurisdictions say we only buy this kind of toilet paper and we have this kind of holder. It gets down to that level. So, um, so there's a whole front end which talks about how the contractor has to work, you know, where he has to put things, how he gets paid, if there are any questions, how they have to get answered. So that's the construction documents. And generally we submit that twice, kind of at a 50% through 50 to 60 percent and then one at the end. We generally apply for permit when those drawings aren't completely finished because a permit office is basically looking for life safety and code issues. So they're going to take a number of months to look at our permit documents. So while we're continuing and finishing things that the permit office could care less about, for instance, how does the wall hit the column? Does it go on the outside, does it hit the middle of the column, how is it done? By the time we get his, their permit comments, we're about finished with the drawings and we can then respond to all the permit comments and incorporate those in the documents. So that process of schematic design, design development, construction documents, as I said, is anywhere from uh, eight to 12 months, depending upon the building and issues that come up decision making by the client, cost problems that we have. So, and at the end of each phase, when we have the estimate, we sit down and if the, our client says, we had $5 million, this is $8 million, what are we gonna do? We get to the point, we get down to $5 million, we make those 
hard decisions at each phase. So by the time we're finished, we're not saying, oh my gosh, we've got to throw half the design out. So that's a normal architectural site planning process. Now, parallel, there's a site planning process, which is totally Byzantine. Um, I could not even attempt to describe it. Uh, every job, I have to ask Jason or another civil engineer, now walk me through it, because it's, it's not a straight line thing. But it ends up at the same I'm not point. sure we have time for that this evening. <laughs> But if I showed you, this is a, a uh, Microsoft project, uh, whoops, I'm sorry, um, schedule. Most of those are JSONs. There's about six lines that are architecture. All the rest of that is what he has to go through step by step by step to get a site plan approval. And um, it's just, it's, it's just very different. And every jurisdiction has their own site plan process. So it, it is somewhat Byzantine. But we've actually together sat down and said, all right, if we started, I think there's a date here of July 1 or something, because we had to have a start date, or August 1st. Um, just kind of went through the process so that you'd have an idea. This can be blown up so you can really see this. But that's the normal process that we all go through. Right. And I, um, I'm not sure if this is a question for you, Mr. Lickmeyer, or the city manager. So the resolution that we're considering then um, to vote on next week, can you just walk us through what this covers? Sure. About the, about the site, the design services. Mm -hmm. Does all of this include, for now, the renovation of the rec department and public restroom because in some drawings that's shaded in and in some drawings it's not so I just double checking from a conceptual standpoint yes, yes it's yeah drawing. so at least yeah. the first yes iteration mm -hmm. okay thank you um, in the in your uh, blue folder there was a revised document mm -hmm. of, of a draft ordinance to be considered next week and um, so what it would do is that um, it kind of cites the the history of the council's um, action so far on the library um, and the authorization of the borrowing of the seven million dollars uh, for renovations to the library. It notes that the library lies in a hundred year floodplain and uh, assuming that the council wishes to uh, move forward with a library that would change the footprint of the library, a new floodplain delineation study was required and, and would need to be completed. The um, at the time, and, and we didn't go through them tonight very much, we referenced them, that, that there's um, the two major options were either to raise the floor of the library or to change the grading of the back parking lot remarkably. Changing the, uh, and moving back that, the, the retaining wall, that's much more expensive than the change to the, to the floor of the library. So assuming that we'd go forward with um, considering raising the floor of the library, um, then there could be issued a um, contract uh, that, and it's about eight hundred thousand dollars, seven nine eight five four five, which, yeah, is the contract uh, amount. Um, and then there would be work products would keep being brought back to the city council at a variety of points to identify, as as Mr. Luke Meyer stated. Um, are there any surprises in what has been found? Are you um, good with the design as it's going? What, how are the cost estimates going? That kind of thing. So there would be that back and forth. Um, while this, this would incorporate the work that would be done on continuing the, flood the rest of the floodplain study, uh, the site plan to get to that rest of the floodplain study and submitting that, um, and then um, and that would move forward through the uh, construction document process if there weren't a decision somewhere in there for the council to do something else. So um, my recommendation is that we authorize the whole thing, recognizing that it's not just all spent immediately. It's one of these right. things that we would be going back and forth through this process with close coordination with the council. Obviously, we can stop at any time if there were some surprises we go forward. 
Okay. All right. So just to make sure we're all clear, the, what the draft resolution that's in front of us um, that we're discussing is to move forward um, on the contract with Mr. Luke Meyer to continue the um, site plans all the way through the construction documents that That's he right. spoke about. And, and does it do construction administration as well, or is that later? Yes. And, and, yes. and, and construction administration. And a construction administration. Yeah. All right. But that we would be coming back so after, for example, the schematic designs and the cost estimates were done, we would come back for that. And then we'd all discuss that, and then you do the design development phase and then come back, come back again when you have 50 percent of the construction documents done, and then... Is or, it, yes, sorry. and I'd like to um, ask a question. I think to to Jason about um, so when I when I was looking at the little work program, it basically said that you would perhaps if you if you were got to go ahead right now, uh, you'd be submitting something somewhere uh, around October, mid October is the first kind of you'd be running this new numbers perhaps. Do you think you? How soon would you get a response back from the county that we're mostly in the in the range of an insignificant rise of the flood elevation level, or is that something that we have to wait the year to find out? Um, <clears throat> to, to answer your question, you know we're gonna we're gonna have the data before we submit to DPS. So mm -hmm. once we finish that initial portion. Mm -hmm. You know, after we've built in the, the building components yeah. and the little grades and everything, we're going to, I mean, it'll have to be vetted with DPS. I'll have to, you know, review it and make sure everything's right, but it's not going to change significantly. You know, there may be some minor you, you things. You would basically, you would have that information and share with us. It's not like we have to wait a long time before we would hear from the county. Right. Right. Okay. Right. I mean, the, you know, we could, there could be decisions made prior to submitting to the county. Right. You know, or, um, you know, at least getting one round of review comments back. That way, you know, if there was something that we missed, mm -hmm. and you know, we're human, we don't do everything perfectly. If we got one round of comments that it's, you know, hey, we're kind of moving in the right direction, we don't see any major mm -hmm. items, you know, that that that's probably of good benefit as well. But we're talking in the in the concept if we went move forward right now, that it would be mid fall kind of time frame that we'd get a good sense of that potentially I, I, I don't know if that October date was predicated on starting August 1 or not I would have to go back and look at that but you know it's it's relative okay. uh, so, that's, so, so, so that's it would be this fall or, or so that's tagged to the schematic design not to the design development it's, it's tagged to the site plan it's, process. it's, it's designed yeah so right. it's it's you on the that. it's on that more convoluted uh, pro project management um, which sheet. core which which corresponds to the, the schematic, schematic design. Yes. Yeah. That's correct. So those two could move in tandem, correct. and then there's a that's right a, a pause or a reporting or a decision or whatever you want to call it point there. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councilmember Cover. Yeah, um, are, are we talking about the the resolution of the moment? Yeah, or? I think so. I mean, we can. I just wanted to make sure to clarify the process. <laughs> and we would have input and make sure we have all the backgrounds and then and now we can move into talking about the draft um, resolution for next week so um, just to clarify I'm in the resolution so the the whereas clauses and the whereas clauses are are stating uh, the, well, let's see, one, two, three, four, the seventh one, the one at the bottom of the first page. So it says, whereas the architectural firm submitted a contract to us in April, and which has the uh, professional services, and it says, as assumed construction costs of $7 million, including furnishings. But it sounds like, unless I'm misunderstanding what we said earlier, that that may not be exactly what we're talking about, right? That's for the library proper. It, it didn't have that section for the for the recreation department, but um, but but for, there's these other costs that you were talking about connected to the um, or that could be funded through the um, the right, cable so piece, so but that's still part of the construction, right? So I'm just trying to reconcile the different numbers there. Yeah, I, I think it's worth looking at again. I'll mm -hmm. double check. Okay, so we'll double check before next week. Yeah. That set that is what should be the appropriate number there. That's 
I, I'm going to ask, I'm going to suggest that on the, whichever, the second to last, first, the first a question, the very last related to what Council Member Cover said, sufficient funds are included. Sufficient funds for the 800,000 or sufficient funds for the 7 million or su sufficient funds for the, for everything, what, what did you mean there? Um, where are you now? Where are you? I'm sorry. The very the last, last where whereas ask clause oh, the the, near the top oh. of the second page. We, um, we could just I think we'll clarify we'll, that. We'll clarify it, but we meant for all of the aspects, not okay. just for the not right. just for this contract. And and maybe we put a dollar in there to the degree that we know what it is right now. Um, and then my second this I'm gonna suggest that we consider in the second to last whereas being a little more specific about the review and feedback. The points, for example, that, um, that you raised about, there's the schematic design, which parallels with the first round of the site plan and maybe some feedback yeah. from the county. Yeah, and, I think but if, can, we, can we spell that out so Yeah, I think we'll, we be, and we'll be in coordination with Greg just to write down like the, the, what yeah, the good, when those what the, points, what the points are, are so everybody knows what they are. Mm -hmm. that, would, that would really help me a lot. Thank okay, you. thanks. And I don't know if it needs to be in the um, what is it, ordinance or not, but maybe in the cover sheet, um, since you do have some target dates, mm -hmm. what we think those target dates are. Because I think what, and Mr. Luke Meyer, you know this better than we do, what happens is, is we get busy, you get busy, we see you three, four, five, six months from now, and we have to <laughs> go over a lot of things again. And so I think it would be beneficial um, if we can pass this next week, at least if it's not appropriate for the ordinance itself, but on the cover sheet to just say, these are the target dates for when we're coming back. Because then, as we're saying the agenda, that I think is helpful to keep in mind. Yeah. Councilmember Kovar, did you have anything yeah, else? Yeah, I, I, uh -huh. I wasn't sure if I left my button or not, but I, but. I, I just want to clarify what I was saying. To me, for this ordinance to, to be ready, we need to have that full analysis of all those different costs and what it means to say that there, I mean, we don't have a budget for th those future years, except for the amount, of course, that we have to pay uh, for, the, for the bond. We know exactly how much that is, but we just need to know what all those costs are. I, I don't feel personally like I'm quite there yet. And I, I hear, and I, I completely that. understand that. I I would want to bring all that to you next right. week. For example, the construction manager, when that comes in. Right, we, we, shared some, we shared some of that information, but we haven't got it in that kind of, a, in that easily But we have that information. We have the information. We just need to put it and compile it in one place that's a simpler like uh, what Councilman, Councilman Costic asked for. That's before. right. Yeah. I understand that there are other parts like once you put it out to bid, we don't know what, what's going to happen with that. And, and it did say Mr. Luke and I would comment on the cost of steel, but is that just something that we don't know at this point? Or I'll be honest with you, in talking to a number of different estimators, I'm getting all kinds of numbers mm -hmm. from 5% uh, to 20%. And I don't know if anybody knows. To be honest with you, and I it will know depend on what year down the road you actually have to purchase it. I guess right. That's correct, and how much, how much steel is being sold. Yeah. I mean, and you know, the structure of a building is usually about 10 percent of the cost of the building. So if steel is going up 5 percent, and that's one component, 5 percent of, you know, 10 percent and. It, it's they're not huge numbers, but it could it could be high. We we recently bid at a library down in the eastern shore of Virginia. And mm -hmm. The estimated was talking about 20 percent, but we don't know because you know we ha we got a bid, but nobody pulls out steel separately. So if that's 10 percent, though, what's the, what are the bigger shares? Is it the labor costs or is yeah. it labor is the biggest? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, labor is, is an issue right now in mm -hmm. this area. Yeah. Great, Councilman Searcy. Uh, um, so I, I do wanna echo um, the sentiments of my colleagues in terms of trying to have a little bit more information. I'm not 100% sold on whether or not that level of specificity needs to be 
in the ordinance per se, or if this might be the best time to really look at the financial implications section of the cover letter and provide some more detailed information about um, current projected costs, noting that they're estimated, as well as um, the current funding streams that we have available to us, like the bond dollars and all of those things, because it seems like there's a lot of different pockets of money um, that we'll be able to take advantage of that will help to kind of offset some of the cost. And so kind of seeing that in the financial section of the cover letter would be really helpful for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That's a great point. All right. I think we're done. You're done before 10. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much for your help. Uh, so I, given um, everyone's feedback, I think we'll proceed then, keep this on the agenda for next week, look for the staff to make these changes, um, and we'll do that. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking slow today. Mm -hmm. Would you mind if I just said one more thing? Is, is there any point to a resolution that looks only at the first part of the $800,000? I completely understand the, the merits I'll bring back an option. I'll, right, I mean, and I don't, I don't know. I, I guess, we, I, and I would just, I would argue the opposite of that if we are ready to move forward, given our council schedule sometimes when we have recesses and other things, um, if we're always having to come back and do an ordinance mm -hmm. okaying the money, like, I just want to think about what is what also, the timing, fit, what what's the would, timing of those things versus if we're a, building into this, we're going to come back. back. For after the schematic, and we're going to make a decision then. Opt out, not opt in. Yeah, yes, exactly. Well, because I just wanted if to we're get going, that like out. If it there. happens to be the week before we're going on December break, or something else happens, again, this project has been held up <laughs> um, for a while for a number of good reasons. But um, we heard tonight, and I think um, you know, folks up. have left that um, we need, there's an urgency here. Um, I think the worst case scenario would be something happening to the heating or air conditioning system or something else and we would have to close the library for a period of time. And so I, I guess I'm personally feeling an urgency if we're ready to move forward that we move forward with this. But I, just, I will, I bring, I will bring back the information it. so that you yeah. have that in front of you. Great. Well, one thing I do want to say is, you know, it. Uh, we should consider this as a resolution to move forward with right. the construction of the project. Right. Saying that um, because you're actually approving design plans for building a new library at the current site. Yeah. And if you're gonna spend 800K mm -hmm. on design, you darn well better have some expectations of building it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just gonna put yeah. that out there. All right, um, next work session was a discussion of the Council Compensation Committee. Who's that you? I honestly don't know who's leading this one, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, I, um, I provided in the cover sheet some information about mm -hmm. what, uh, what is included in the code regarding, thank you, um, what's included in the code regarding um, the Council Compensation Committee and the principles of compensation. And in 2007, the first council compensation committee recommended that the council adopt principles of compensation to guide the work of future committees that would be reviewing this. Um, so essentially, they are the positions of mayor and council member are part time and should be treated that way. Full monetary compensation for the mayor and council members is not appropriate. It is appropriate to monetarily compensate the mayor and council members to some extent for their work. Monetary compensation <coughs> creates an obligation to perform the job. Monetary compensation provides status to the mayor and council members. The mayor's salary should be greater than that of council members. And the compensation for mayor and council should be comparable to Maryland municipalities of similar size and complexity. And so, pursuant to the way this is in the city code, when the council 
appoints the council compensation committee to make a recommendation as to the salary for the next city council, the, the committee would be charged with staying somewhat within the guidelines that were established in the code unless you make a decision to change that. But that is what's codified right now, is using those principles of compensation. And I understand that sometimes it can be frustrating to a committee that's looking at all the issues surrounding compensation because it can be somewhat limiting, but that's what prior councils agreed to and included in the code. And can I ask, what would it take for us to, would it just be a majority vote for us to change these recommendation principles? Well, uh, changing the city code is a, it's a two reading ordinance. Right, right, adopted but I'm, I'm by just saying that, yes, but this council, could we just give direction to a new compensation committee to say, you don't really have to follow these, we want you to recommend something else rather than sticking to this. Or if, if they put in, put another way, if we ask them to consider whether they recommend changing or adding to this. Yes, of course, you could you could and charge you, a committee with, with making a recommendation to mm -hmm. as to whether or not these they still consider these to be um, valid principles yeah. of compensation. They actually act on something. But they couldn't they, they couldn't actually actually act on that, but they could look into it. That that's right. They you could ask them to make a recommendation, of course. And and the the group that you appoint or when you recruit members I guess you'll want you'll want people to know, I think, what framework they're going to be working mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. when you recruit members to serve on this compensation committee. And it is important that um, their work be done and in place before before the next election, because this will uh, it, it's your job to um, set a salary for the next city council. Because I just think that these principles, you know, I mean, this was done in 2007. Mm -hmm. I don't think they really apply to yeah. what's going on, Yeah. you know. Uh, and if we just give people the charge, because I remember when I first got on the council, there was already a compensation committee in place. They came up with a recommendation. They couldn't make any changes because of these principles. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think they relate now. Especially and that was a finding from the last right. compensation. Right. Well, can I ask yeah. a question on that? So how much, I don't know how many people we're talking about, how much time do they need and how far in advance of the election does it have, does it have to be done? I mean, would six months finishing up in June be su sufficient for them? Or do they need to, a year and, whoop, a year and do they need to know, uh, you know, uh, well in advance, if, if you see what I'm saying? Right. Um, well, that, that's really up to you. I, I, would, I would think you would want to, to not have it brushing up against the election right. season right. starting. I would think you would, might want it settled before, certainly January, February, March, something like that at the latest. And I, I guess it, it just depends on how long you think it may take them and how willing they are to meet perhaps more frequently to get the work done. Well, I don't, I don't know what Council Member Smith had in mind, but you know, it, it did strike me that in the, um, in the racial equity considerations, it says that you know, it's been suggested that the salary and the amount of time required mm -hmm. to serve makes it especially difficult for lower income residents. Yep. I would love to, if they could at least look into whether that should be changed, whether we need to change it for them this time. I'm, I'm okay personally with the money, and I would do it for less, but I think it's important to, no, I think it's you important to, to, <laughs> look at it. to, to look at opening that up because I think it does affect who can contemplate running. So whether we need to say, look at that this time officially or just consider that so that we can think about it for the next time, I, I'm not sure what the answer is there, but somehow I think I'd love to see that point looked at. That's, well, that's would it be thing. possible, I'm just gonna throw that out there, I, this, this idea out there, I'm not sure if it's a good idea, if we, before, 
before convening a committee to set the, the compensation, we have a committee that we try and recruit in August or early September to look at these principles and we give them and report back to us. And just like we did with the legal services group, you know, we don't give them a, a huge amount of time, but if we had them get back to us, say, late October, whether or not these principles should still stand or other ones that could we could still mm -hmm. convene a compensation committee then that maybe could be able to get back to us in late January. I guess I just want to work backwards from like when we would definitely need something and is there time to squeeze in a committee that would review these seven principles and report back to us. Right, mm -hmm. and then you could decide whether you want, I suppose you could decide whether, would you want an option to let these people continue to then Sure. Yeah. Go that's, on that's, or, yeah, or yeah, not. You don't yeah. necessarily have to decide. Do that. a new committee. Yeah. It seems that you could do this if that's what you want to do. Sure. Because I think that would. I agree with Councilmember Smith in looking at these principles. And I know the last committee that met in 2015, when they reported back to us, that was one of the things they felt very constricted by was these principles and that, right. and what they recommended to us. I would just like to note that I did vote for these principles. <laughs> I think, I I think, I think you're the only one on the <laughs> <laughs> All right, so why don't we, well, when we meet on Friday morning, um, mm -hmm. we can discuss sort of like a game plan, like scheduling that out if everyone else is okay with that and then come back with. Yeah, yeah, one, yeah. One other thing. So the only thing, if I understood what you were saying, it was, appoint a group of people to consider whether these things are, are, are appropriate. Is that what you were saying as the first step? So the, yeah. the only thing I guess I would say is I would like, and my colleagues and I maybe we wouldn't all agree on it, but I would like us to be able to say that, but also here are three things we really want you to look at as opposed to just leaving it up to them because we see certain things That's fair. when yeah. we're doing it that maybe other people don't. It, 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 it's not hugely different from what you're suggesting, but I, I wouldn't want to More direction, it. not leave it just open-ended. Direction open and open-ended. Right. Like, go as open-ended yeah. as you want, but don't. But please look and include these two or three things yeah. in it. That, I guess that's what I'm saying, yeah. Cool, and I would just say if there are some things, just because, again, we have to like, kind of work backwards from the next election to start thinking about that soonish so that, you know, we yes. can start moving on this and recruiting people for it. Yeah, I, I mean, to echo um, Council Member Kovar's point, I mean, I really like how the legal services work yeah. group um, kind of approached their recommendations and interviewing and talking right. to folks. And I think a similar approach could be applicable here, where maybe they're, they're chatting with members on the council to get a better feel for what are some of the things that we're experiencing actually yeah. doing the job and what we would recommend. And then they can do some research and then they can come back with recommendations to us. Yeah, the last committee did a survey. And actually, it was a pretty good one that they gave us to, to fill out mm -hmm. um, in terms of like how much time we spend on certain things and what we think. So, but then they didn't really. If, for, those of, for those <laughs> of us who weren't around at that point, is it possible to get yes. a summary of what yeah. transpired yes. last time around? I Thank can you. provide that, sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good. I think we have a plan and we can suss this out a little bit more on Friday and come back. Okay. All right, um, we're going to do city manager overview of projects in the city. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to rush through this, I think, um, but give some highlights. So what I've done is um, updated the major projects chart that um, I've passed out about every six months. Mm -hmm. um, and most of these are links to the project pages on the website that give a lot more detail information. I did note a broken link on one of them and and we're a little bit behind on a couple of them in getting the the detail of the financial information um, on the sites but but in general the project sites uh, project pages are very helpful we talk about some things in this uh, in this chamber but a whole lot is going on with city staff and so it's kind of useful <coughs> to remember that a lot of different things are, are being worked on um, our um, HCD staff have a number of projects um, underway. The new F bikeways design, um, public space management plan, 
Um, the parking management plan is looking forward to the task force members being appointed so they can um, work on that. Um, there has been a good amount of coordination um, with MCPS on site selection of schools um, and that discussion will continue even as we talk a little bit about the hospital site. I'm kind of I'm kind of skipping around a little bit, but that's the first first page. Um, the um, some of the really big things have kind of either been accomplished or in, in a different um, situation, such as the small cell antennas. We worked our butts off, and you did as well on that. Um, now we're now we're doing it, and so um, we're monitoring what that workload is um, and keeping track of that. I think um, coming to you in September and October, there will be uh, a good amount of environmental kinds of things. The um, stormwater management fee structure will be coming before you and, and how do you get credits um, or, or how do you have uh, varied rates based on how much impermeable, impermeable surface you have on your property um, and, and how that interacts with sustainability efforts and with the tree ordinance and the tree canopy discussions that are underway right now. Fl Flower Avenue, Green Street, hopefully will be obvious. And the climate plan. And, and the, it, yes, and the climate plan is part of that sustainability um, efforts. And I think that's going to be really, uh, we will have the presentation back to council on that in the fall. And one thing about Flower Avenue. Can, yes. Uh, can regular updates be yeah, put I've, out? They, I know they got stalled while we were trying to figure out what was going on with WSSC, and I, I made a note actually about that earlier today that we needed that. Even if you can just say we're at the whatever yeah. block, right. WSSC is replacing, you know, That's so right. that residents don't send messages saying nothing's happening. Right. I will do that. Thank well, you. Well, why am I stuck in traffic, which is what I get. Right. Some of the other really big ones, obviously, that uh, was the LED conversion, and that's almost done uh, with just a few more shades, I think, that are out there, and, and that's just a terrific um, effort. There has been some discussion, and thanks to council members, uh, some added effort about MOUs with uh, DC government. Appreciate that. Lots of elements on this about kind of improving communications, whether it's working with SHA on things and other utilities, um, just improving how we interact with uh, residents and our language uh, translations and that kind of thing. Uh, we are continuing to work on those things that feels there's not really good targets about how we know when we get there <laughs> and it, we just keep working on those. The police department renovation work, uh, which will take place this fall, will be really obvious in this building. And, um, you know, we're talking about the library and the impact of that, but, but the first thing that people are going to see are the changes while we're um, trying to have the police department continue operations uh, while the uh, atrium floor gets filled in, the new dispatch space um, gets built out. and. They're all looking forward to it, but it's also because it's been a little bit of a moving target. It is in for permit review right now at the county. Uh, the documents are there. We are, once those things um, then can go out to bid and we, and we get that work underway, um, it changes a little bit how our building operates, so we'll have to have a lot of communication with folks. It changes the art displays. It changes, obviously, how people interact with the police department. And so um, we're looking forward to it, but it, um, it is something that I don't think we've talked about in public for a long time. And so I think it will be really obvious. Um, so, so you will we will talk about it. Come back and as soon as we have, as soon as we have good dates, what it is. right, yeah. as soon as we have good dates, we'll, we will get the word out. On this chart are uh, a number of IT um, internal work projects. These are big projects that are really important. And whether it is how to deal with the various um, security demands that uh, continue to be challenging for municipalities, um, how we continue to um, 
just change with the times with the equipment uh, requires a lot of work for a three-person office um, and we are upgrading um, everything from the internal systems to security cameras you'll see the wires hanging down from parts of the building so that work is ongoing um, really appreciate that uh, it will be very helpful once it's uh, completed where does the um, so-called ransomware thing fit into all this? I will have Jason, the and I did talk with... about that earlier, but I just wondered. Right. No, which... it's, it comes up, and, and it's a scary thing. It's... Yeah, um, so in the context of IT projects, um, you know, I wouldn't say that there's a specific project um, that we're doing um, to specifically address ransomware. Um, the IT director is very aware of issues that municipalities across the country are experiencing. We're, I'm grateful to have him actually be so forward thinking in that regard. Um, we have put a number of security measures in place, including uh, backing up our information in multiple places. Um, uh, we are actually carrying forward funds in the budget amendment um, to do a vulnerability test. He's going to bring in a third party to come in and plug into our systems uh, to see where there may be any gaps that, um, you know, people who are as familiar as they are with our systems um, may not, you know, may miss. Um, we're also going to be doing uh, a training. Um, he, we actually spoke yesterday about him getting materials together to get out to staff um, to make sure people are aware of what to, to be on the lookout for, what not to click. Um, we, he, uh, the IT department periodically sends out emails um, when their spam filters catch certain things. Um, you know, the, the problem is the attacks get more and more sophisticated every day, um, mm -hmm. and there is no way that anybody um, can be 100% secure. Um, I think we're in as good of a place as we can be, and, uh, you know, we continue to monitor what's going on and uh, do our best to stay a ahead of um, the, the sophisticated folks doing the, the malware attacks and ransomware attacks. You know, and I think uh, one of the things that is, is scary is that, um, well, you've, you've heard about Baltimore and Atlanta as, as being really big um, victims. Um, actually, larger sums of money are being asked from small municipalities. And, um, and there's real questions about how much should insurance pay for them. And, you know, so there, it's a, it is a debate. It, I'm interested in, in seeing how ICMA and other organizations, what recommendations they give on that. So, yes, we want to be protected from the IT side. Um, the other part of that is if, if we are subject to an attack, how do you know what is the best practice of dealing with it and it's it's a, it's fascinating scary but fascinating yeah and we're aware of actually some other jurisdictions neighboring jurisdictions that aren't baltimore who have been um, subject to attack and have paid ransoms um, mm -hmm. they're smaller amounts in the tens of thousands of dollars rather than hundreds of thousands or millions um, <laughs> but uh, you know it, it probably does behoove us to have a conversation about that um, mm -hmm. I don't, that may be a closed session discussion. Then. Yeah. And I'll just add that 60 Minutes did a piece on this, so everyone yeah. should watch it. Yeah. Uh, and this is like the new bank robbery. Oh, know, yeah. Because yeah. people just ask for enough money from a municipality that they know that they'll give it to them, or even a hospital, because in some cases they lock down the systems and, you know, patients need right. access and, yeah. you know, the hospital eventually pays. Yeah. On that happy note. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that, um, I think there's going to be a lot coming up that it will involve the council, but the, the city election planning is something that you'll be hearing about, uh, coming back up again. And, um, so just kind of keep that on your, on your wavelength. Uh, the, I'm going to skip just one thing, the Tacoma Junction development projects moving forward. There's a submission posted today for the Historic Preservation Commission, um, and so we've posted it on our city website. Um, it's been submitted for another preliminary consul consultation with, uh, with the HPC, and I'm blanking out the day, August 15th, I think? I think it's the 14th. 17th. 
I'm sorry? I think it's the 17th. Okay, it's on the website, so <laughs> I'm blanking out at the, the moment, but uh, mid-August. Um, and the the primary um, it's discussion. It's August 14th. The 14th. We, we danced around it. <laughs> okay, I heard the 14th, so Mr. Cobra was correct. Um, the uh, that they're primarily NDC is primarily asking for a consultation on uh, a couple components. One is a revised height of the building, revised materials for the tower, and um, trying to keep the the building not to be set back farther than uh, was originally uh, discussed. And I. I will note that there was, I had a discussion with Gwen Wright in the planning department about the, uh, what a historic commercial um, street frontage should be and that it should have a building wall. So it'll be interesting to see how that discussion with HPC goes. Um, and so that those materials are posted on the city website. They won't be posted, I think, on the HPC website for another week or so, um, or maybe several weeks. But um, we at least will have that. The HPC um, hearing, uh, preliminary consultation is open to the public and the public can comment. The public can comment, the public can comment as in there's a comment period? There's, or a, comment, as in there's a comment period. Okay, it, thank you. It's, like it's a public hearing. I mean, it's a, it's a public body. Um, at the same time, the Tacoma Junction Intersection Improvements Envisioning Project is continuing. Um, they are kind of, they've collected a lot of the survey data, the information from the stakeholder group and the charrette kind of meetings that they held. Um, my understanding is that they have transferred most of that information to District 3 to start looking at design and they're ha gonna give us some updates I think even next week to just let us know where they're, uh, what that process is likely to look like. The goal is to have some, um, some things for consideration uh, by the end of kind of late fall this year, so. We have on the line purple line preparation um, and um, you know, the it says construction hasn't directly affected Tacoma Park yet. Um, I would not say that's true. Okay. I, <laughs> The, 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 it's not, it is not a good place to drive through the area if you're trying to get there fast uh, or even at a regular speed. Um, and because of that, I think it's bringing it home to the businesses and the folks in the area that this is happening and that they need to learn kind of how to do things over the long, long haul. Um, I did get a really neat document when I was at the MML conference um, from a, an, another small town that had their entire main street under construction by SHA for like nine months. And worse than here, so I just have to say, uh, there, it was really a remarkable project that of their, of their one air, commercial area. And they had a wonderful handbook for the businesses. And so we're looking at seeing if we can't come up with some version of that for us because uh, it was, it, it acknowledged a couple things. One is you need to have something to know who to call when something happens of these different kinds. But also a reminder that as a business owner, if somebody has gone, come through the construction into your business, they're probably grumpy. And just recognizing, and not taking it personally as a business owner, recognizing maybe doing something fun, make a joke out of it, have some other kind of gimmicks that the town can work with and that kind of thing. It, that just kind of recognizing, look, this is how it's gonna be for a while. Um, and, and taking, I just thought it was a really nice approach. I thought it was well thought through. It was in the hidden back room with the other, with where the different towns, you know, put out their things, but it was really a useful document. Um, continuing on, John Nevins Andrews School Property, there is a, a proposal at this point for um, 
at least some discussion about perhaps a senior living uh, or assisted living of some kind facility. We're still learning more about that. I don't know, um, Ms. Kostick, have, have you seen anything more recently about a presentation no, I, or anything? No, I haven't. I know they're still in discussions, as far as I know, yeah. with, um, with different groups, and they're okay. trying to figure out where things will go from here. Okay. Yeah. But I think it's, as that um, gets a little bit more finalized, there'll be some community discussions, and, and then, then it'll come through uh, the city council through as part of the development review process. Do we have any idea what the uh, ballpark number is that they're asking for? You know, I don't know right now. I don't know right now. I mean, it started at $9 million, but it's, I, it's less that now, but I don't know what, what the number is. Thank you. We did protect Dorothy's Woods. That says completed. Uh, we talked about the library renovation and expansion project. One of the things that um, we're not going to be discussing next week, um, but we will be discussing in the fall, and we are hoping to have um, shared with you next week or so, is a real pretty good draft housing and economic development strategic plan. Um, for you to comment on and really look through. We, I think our staff has done wonderful work with um, the information and there's been some communication with a number of you. Um, so I'm hoping that um, we have a document that, that you and the public can think about so that uh, in the fall we can actually adopt it. Many of the things we're working on right now so we don't let it just sit. But I just, I, I know that some members of the public have not seen that and I do want to get it out. Uh, for a uh, conversation. Another thing that's being worked on very heavily is, um, is the thinking so that we can talk about the rec center. And um, one of the things that we're working on is uh, drafting an RFP for a public engagement firm. We've also had some uh, grant applications being considered to help us get some additional funds. Um, all of this is kind of prep work to come back to you for discussion and, and then get the go-ahead about how we move with the various stakeholders um, on the project. And um, so these are big lifts for staff. I just want you to know that there's a lot of work being done on it right now and it will be coming back to you. So we're going to be very, very busy in the fall. Um, I'm going to jump down. Uh, to Montgomery College, that's something that's been ongoing, and so we'll be monitoring that. Um, one of the more um, significant projects, I think, that will be coming up um, has to do that with the hospital site. And I think there's several pieces of information about that. First, um, you know, it's our understanding that the university will be buying it, that closing would be in a year or so, when the hospital has pretty much vacated the site. Um, I think, I don't think they've really made a major statement. I think they want to talk about partnerships and there's some discussions ongoing. Um, certainly they identified that that was something that they were doing. Um, Are they actually buying it? It's my... <laughs> no, I mean, is it... I, just a transfer, right? They're just transferring funds that. Went I can't to speak to the. I can't speak to what the closing co closing arrangements would be. I cannot. Okay. I, I just, cannot speak to that. Okay. And and I don't know that they know. All right. I think that this as a as a discussion for something that happens in a year, um, it's to be determined. It's not a traditional sell. I'm not going to speak to that. I okay. can't say that. Right. Um, what I what I can say is that that they are um, that the university is working with a uh, a real estate partner that we are trying to have communication with so we can have some discussions uh, on on how uh, kind of sharing sharing of information because we have a lot of information. Do they have a website? The no. partner. Uh, yes, yeah. I'll I'll talk with you about. Okay. It. The thing that um, I, part of my, I had a conversation with Glenn Wright. I'm trying to think what day it was. <laughs> was it just? Yeah, it wasn't just yesterday, was it? it was just yesterday. Oh, jeez. So it was. It was yesterday. It was <laughs> so I know there was a reason that I've been tired lately. It was yesterday. Um, 
it was an interesting conversation that I, I primarily spoke to her about the hospital property and what is what happens with a property that's such a large property that's zoned R60 with a conditional use for a hospital when the hospital leaves? What's the process of determining uh, how it's zoned? What's the process of, of uh, considering uh, the development review steps? And we talked a lot about, um, I guess there had been a proposal that maybe a local map amendment would happen just for the property. To me, that spot zoning, there's a problem with that when you're not thinking about how does it fit in with the whole community? What are the public facility needs in terms of schools or parks or housing or other kinds of things that we've talked about? Um, and how does that work to recognizing that if you choose some of these, it might affect other properties, such as Piney Branch Elementary School, there's John Nevins Andrews property, which is zoned R60 and, and is, is empty. There's a variety of other sites that, that may be changing. And so um, they are considering instead, and she's considering instead, a minor master plan amendment process. Um, and so that's something that I will be trying to uh, work to encourage getting into this system. That process would not begin for a year. Um, and in fact, one of the things that I think the university does not appreciate <coughs> is that even a local map amendment process hardly starts within a year. Um, and so it's, it's simply going to take a very long time to go through and think through what the, what the rules are that apply to this. Um, but it, uh, yeah. a new master plan, plan or a master plan revision is long overdue. Yes, and we talked about that. So that would be the right way to do things. Uh, it's 20 years since the last master plan was done. The problem is that it's not in park and planning's work plan and they don't have the money to have the staff to do that. They're also losing staff and having staff positions developed, we'll say that. Um, and so we could force that issue. I think it's a big stretch to be able to get a, a master plan update. Um, that takes a longer time. That's, that's even more like a 18 months or two year process. Um, what I was hoping and part of the discussion that I had was that with a minor master plan, if housing is considered one of the things that, that might be something that happens on the hospital property, it implies a look at schools because it increases the need for school space. Mm. And that would help allow a larger discussion. So it wouldn't just be about that property, but it could look a little bit larger at the, at the community. So what is the trigger for the county to do a new master plan? It's it's a what is the trigger is yeah. is it is it on the park and planning work plan as a, as directed by the county council okay so the county council makes that decision when the That's master right. plans are updated and okay. it does come with money it's okay. an issue of, of funding all right because 20 years that's a long time mm -hmm. that's a right. lot has changed mm -hmm. well and that was my point yesterday that was my point yesterday that that we do have a different kind of community yeah. uh, and there's uh, there's a lot of different discussions going on, uh, so that such that the current master plan's out of date. Right. So it's I just wanted to let you know we're having lots of discussions. Staff is doing a lot of work. Public works. I didn't talk a lot about Can that. Can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. Um, it, has there been any change regarding or discussion regarding the moratorium on building based on the school cluster? Yeah, really. No, there's still a moratorium. The, the issue, my understanding is that it's primarily related to the, the high school and middle school yeah. populations. It's not so much on elementary school populations, even though that's our need here more. Mm -hmm. um, it's just going to take a while for them to build the buildings. But it, uh, there's but a still, huge, but that still impacts whether or not housing can be built, absolutely. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And I and I think that's you know th that is real harm when it comes to many of our economic development initiatives. Yeah. Uh, the I think the uh, it's um, Northwood, 
is it, mm -hmm. what is it, yeah, that needs to be like doubled in size or something. Mm -hmm. And that's under it's well, being the number, the number of portables they just put at uh, the number of portables they just put at Blair is ridiculous this summer. Well, yeah, there's the, how do you how do you even bring the buses on site? I mean, it's it's crazy. But in any event, I'll, so, I'll, I'll, last question. Yes, one sir. last question. So mm -hmm. when will uh, the hospital site go back onto the tax rolls? And th that's a good question. As part of what I, I've actually got still working on identifying an attorney to assist us with some answers to some of those questions. Um, the, uh, the acute care patients move out August 25th, yep. which is a lot of the hospital space. Um, the rest of the space will be vacated by about June. Um, next the new June next year. What I have understood is that um, as space becomes vacated, the State Department of Assessment and Taxation can start prorating um, for th as as taxable property, okay. and so um, then they have to do that. It takes a while for them to identify. We have to prod them, and then they do it. Um, and I think, you know, we will continue and be prodding them, um, simply because a property is owned by a nonprofit or a religious institution, uh, does not mean that it's not taxable. It's the use of the property, and and it and it doesn't mean that it just one little thing on a site means the whole site. You do prorate the the land, right. so we will okay. be moving that. Along. Okay, good. Yes, sir? Yeah, um, you mentioned really briefly um, Montgomery College, and uh -huh. I just want to say two things about Please that. Please do. One, I'm going to be speaking to a few of the residents uh, maybe over the weekend, and their the interest is in coming up with a list of the questions and maybe protocols can be worked out for how the construction process mm -hmm. will work. I think I Good. mentioned that to you before, and yes. that's something we we'll want to talk about. I don't, I, I wouldn't say that has to be passed as a council document, but in some ways at least we should understand what it is. Mm -hmm. And then the second piece of it is, and I mentioned this to Daryl Braithwaite, a few of the residents would like to talk with her uh, about how the stormwater management process will work. I know that falls within staff authority, right. but I think there's a desire to understand uh, among the public, you know, how that will work. And so okay. uh, yeah, we'll, I, I we'll think work you've on mentioned that. that. Yeah. Uh -huh. yep. Thanks. So in sum, we're doing a lot. Mm -hmm. Our staff is very, very, very busy. Uh, one of the things that's not on here, but is a major project, especially for the deputy city manager, is hiring mm -hmm. an HR director. So mm. yeah. that's huge. I think that's it. Please ans ask any questions. Send them if you know, or if you don't find something you want to find out about a particular project, just let me know. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great. Um, I think our last thing on our list was for the mayor pro tem committees update. Not from me tonight. Not from you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we had a whole uh, long list. Uh, it, it was uh, in nobody's, the email. Nobody's talking on their, nobody's talking on their oh. oh, yeah, my mic. Uh, Mr. Stevens, the list was in an email that I sent yes, this afternoon. Um, I um, have it up here. I could certainly just share it with you. Would you? I can give it to him. On okay. My... All right, a minute. I think the mayor is going to bail me out here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that list was way too long for me to <coughs> think that I was going to read this. Uh, <laughs> well, and I there think, are. Go oh, ahead. I'm sorry. I just wanted to say, and I, I think there were still some decisions that maybe the council is not prepared to make. So. Right. I. This one. Pardon? The, I think the cl complete safe streets one. Is that? Okay. I, all I was going to say is I think the uh, the list is to way too long to be. Um, to I don't know how you use your machine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, way too long to read the whole thing. I, since we all have this in our packets. But there are a number of uh, committee appointments coming before us in the near term uh, for the Board of Elections, for COLTA, the Recreation Committee, the 
Committee on the Environment, the Complete Safe Streets Committee, the Youth Council, and um, rather than read everyone's name that's on here, I encourage my colleagues to look at their packets and uh, if they have any uh, discussion on these, to uh, voice that, bring it to the mayor's attention. Um, and I really think that's uh, that's it. This is going to be coming back before us uh, next week. probably next week. So we're mm -hmm. going to be voting on them. Yeah, and I think the only one that is still probably outstanding is the complete safe streets um, because it seems like everybody in Ward 3 wants to be on there that. There are some awesome applications there are for, some the, awesome for that committee, and there are a lot of Ward 3 residents, which is awesome. Yes. But, but I, I, also, I recognize they're all in uh, yeah. Ward 3. <laughs> I will also point out that uh, not just for that committee, but for other committees, if uh, anyone in uh, Wards 4, 5, or 6 uh, have uh, constituents who might like to participate in one of the committees, to please get Money. those in. Right. Ward five's coming in strong middle. on the youth council. Yeah, <laughs> that's very good. So good. All right. So we will uh, look at this um, next week. Cause I know a, a number of folks are waiting to be confirmed and move forward. Uh, and it's ten thirty. We're gonna call it, and we'll be back again uh, next Wednesday. Thanks, everyone.